We'll uh, woo, go ahead then and get started. Hopefully I didn't just screw up my camera. Uh, see that edge, I think we're good. Okay, so starting now a new class, uh, History of Western Philosophy. Now, two disclaimers. Well, one disclaimer and then one more. So first disclaimer, one, I am not a philosophy major. I am a mathematics and computer science major. I never formally studied any of this stuff. Pretty much everything I know in philosophy is from my own readings of the works directly. I took one philosophy class in college called Intro to Philosophy. I was not impressed, and I would not say I learned much from that. So as far as my own professional education in the field, that's what it comes out to. Two, something you should know, and I'll tell you right out the door. I very often disagree with what professional philosophers have to say. I listen to what professional philosophers say about Plato, and I think a bunch of their stuff that they say is just stupid. And I'll be very blunt where I disagree with uh, what the what a more professional view is, but suffice it to say, I don't have a lot of, uh, I have a very high regard for most people in the field of philosophy. There's some great ones out there, but as a general whole, I don't have that high of opinion of them. So there's my own biases, there's my disclaimer that I'll give you right out the door. Second thing is just a warning. It is very easily to go through some philosophical argument and feel like piece by piece you kind of get it, you kind of get it, and it takes you to some absurd conclusion. And so there's this attitude I often get when I like am in philosophical circles that, well, if you don't have a better argument or you can't figure out why the argument's wrong, you should accept the argument. I think that that is asinine, and I'm going to hopefully give you an example. Math group. Negative 1 is equal to negative 1 to the power of 1, right? Yeah. Negative 1 to the power of 1, that's just negative 1. Yeah. 1 is the same thing as 2 over 2. So it's negative 1 to the power of 2 over 2. Just replace a 1 with 2 over 2. Nothing wrong there. You've probably learned some of your exponent rules. Taking those, you can split it up into two exponents, 2 and 1 half. When you have an exponent to an exponent, so that's the same as multiplying it. So. Split it up, multiply it, same thing, just splitting them up. You might have learned that raising something to the one half power is the same thing as taking the square root of it. So this is the square root of negative one squared. There should be an overline, I just didn't take the time to figure out how to do that in Google Slides. <laughs> square root of negative one squared, right? Uh, yeah. Now, what is negative one squared? What's well, negative one times negative one? One. one? one. So this is the square root of one. What's the square root of one? It's one. I just got negative one equals one. Now you're probably a little bit confused by that argument. And you probably don't know what, how I cheated. I cheated. Don't think for a second negative one's equal to one. I cheated. This is a one line argument. This is a one line argument on a field I'm pretty sure all of you have had several years studying algebra. You spent years studying this. This is a one line argument and chances are the majority of you are confused by this argument. The logic that you should accept negative one is equal to one simply because you don't know what's wrong with the argument is asinine. If the conclusion is absurd, reject the argument. You don't even know why it's wrong, you know that it's wrong. Because you know negative one most certainly is not one. So I disagree with that position wholeheartedly. If an argument doesn't absolutely convince you every step of the way, appeal to your logic, you're convinced, okay, it can't be wrong, okay, then adopt the argument. But don't be taken, don't be fooled into thinking utterly asinine things that, depending on how far we go in this class, we'll come across asinine worldviews. And start accepting them because you think it's some clever argument. If I can trick you, if I can cleverly trick you with one line of something that you've studied a lot of, how easy would it be to trick you with a whole book of stuff that you've never studied before? And you've got to go through this whole book to really understand the argument. There's a lot of room for error. And in case one of you figured out that one, I decided I better come up with another one just in case. So here's another one for you. Two is equal to one plus one, right? Yeah. One is the same thing as the square root of one. So one plus one is one plus the square root of one. We can rewrite one as negative one times negative one, all under the radical. So replace that one with negative one times negative one. Split up my radical. So that's the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. That's 1 plus 
Square root of negative 1, that's just i. Square root of negative 1, that's just i. What's i times i? Negative 1. So you got 1 plus negative 1. Or 1 minus 1. 0. Ah, 2 is equal to 0. Now hopefully, between all of you, at least one of these two arguments confuses you. That's a great experience. Warning! 2 is not equal to 0. Never accept that conclusion. This argument is bad I cheated. You might not know how I cheated, but you know that I cheated. Because the conclusion is absurd. What does absurd mean? Impossible. How can you Leads to logical contradictions. <laughs> <laughs> See, I understand what you mean by that. Okay. Well, absurd isn't necessarily always a logical contradiction. Unfortunately, to some extent, in seeing what something, what's absurd, is not always something that you can get in some nice context, because there's still th things you have to presuppose to even build a logic. And so you may end up contradicting or going against uh, something contrary to those fundamental assumptions. But just relying on your intuition for the time being is good enough. I would warn you that if it feels absurd, it probably is absurd. It's good fallback. It should take a lot to convince you. Okay, that's the disclaimer and the warning. Now we get to philosophy. That's what we're starting with. Or love of wisdom. Okay. So what is philosophy? Appropriate place to start a philosophy class. What is it? Well, if you look at its etymology, it's Philane and Sophia combined. Philane is to love, Sophia is wisdom, and so looking at its etymology, it literally means the love of wisdom. Okay, that doesn't really tell me what philosophy is. Now, if you went and asked on a philosophy major what philosophy is, you would get a very unsatisfactory answer. And so I'm going to give you a bunch of very unsatisfactory answers, depending on who you ask. So, here's one way of doing philosophy. Initially, any field of study came under the heading of philosophy. So these early Greeks that we talk about, when they start doing mathematics, that's going to fall under philosophy. When they're doing science, it's going to fall under philosophy. If they're doing the study of anything, that comes under the umbrella of philosophy. So any field of study came under the heading of philosophy, and it can still be, and it can still be universally applied. You can talk about any field you want, and I can talk about the philosophy of that field. You want to talk about horseback riding? We can talk about what's your philosophy of horseback riding. When you talk about math, we can talk about your philosophy of math. You can pick anything, and you can talk about your philosophy of it. In that sense, kind of everything's philosophy. Not a very satisfactory answer. But, strictly speaking, it can be used in this umbrella term kind of way. Okay. Second answer you commonly get. It's seen as the fringe of current knowledge. So something is philosophy until that field separates and goes off on its own. And this is kind of a historical definition of what counts as philosophy. So even as we go through the history of philosophy, we're going to talk about mathematics as being part of philosophy until Euclid breaks it up. And if we went far enough, we talk about science as being part of philosophy until Galileo or Isaac Newton split it off. And until chemistry splits off, biology splits off, psychology splits off. Initially, they're all at one point considered philosophy, and they eventually split off and became their own branches. That's another way it's often described. Good with that? All right. Now I'm going to give you my own notion for what counts, what I say counts as philosophy the majority of the time. Here's what I think is a good, more satisfactory definition that catches what most people mean when they're talking about something being philosophy. Philosophy starts by inductively reasoning on common experience, experiences common to all people. So philosophy starts by inductively reasoning on common experience to some premises, and then applying logic or deductive reasoning to set premises to come to conclusions in a systematic way. And usually, if that's the type of thinking behind it, we call that philosophy today. That's my own terminology. These are what wiser people than me have to say. Okay. Isn't that bottom one pretty much the same as science? No. Good catch. Replace this common experience with observable, quantifiable phenomena. So replace common with observable, quantifiable, and now you've got your science. And that's the big difference. What's a common experience? Human beings feel sad. It's a common experience. Not me dropping an apple. 
You even dropping an apple, that's still more than this. An apple fell from your hand, accelerated downward from your hands at 9.81 meters per second squared. That's now an observable, quantifiable phenomenon. And that's the type of observation we can start science from. And so that's good. There's this branch that's separating between science and philosophy. And the difference in them is how they set up their foundations here. Since science starts with observable, quantifiable phenomena, then it instantly pulls in that math. And so it's easy to encode your premises in some mathematical model. And so science has the advantage of you can use math to do your logic. Rather than having to do logic directly, math is like doing a ton of logic all in one go. And so now you can use math instead of logic to come to conclusions. And so it's turbo speed. It's way faster, way more effective, way safer. And that's why science has just exploded since it's come up. And philosophy is still just fighting with itself. And it feels like there's hardly ever any progress. Mm -hmm. So, good. Glad you caught that. Okay. So, with that, we need to briefly talk about what the different types of reasonings are that we use and help you understand exactly what I meant when I was talking about philosophy. Because I used deductive and inductive reasoning when I was explaining philosophy. So let's explain these reasonings and then go back and read that definition one more time, and I think you'll get it. So, reasoning. Tell me something that you know. No, with a capital K. The sky is blue. The sky is blue. Okay, how do you know? I look at the sky and it's blue. You look at the sky and it's blue. Mm -hmm. You look at it over and over and over again and it's always blue every time you look at it? When I look at it, most of the time it's blue. Okay, this isn't really... <laughs> let's, let's do an attack on this to just show him that's not really in the umbrella of this class. Should we attack the sky's blue? <laughs> sure. All right, let's attack the sky's blue just for a second. So you say the sky is blue. First question would be, what's the sky? The... Have I reached it yet? Tell me when to stop. Tell me when to stop. Or what's blue? It's what we can I use see. that. It's what I see while I look up. It's what you see. Can't have a definition in terms of your own subjective experience. But let's stick with blue, because that's an easier one to think about. What's blue? Don't say color. Because so is green. It's a wavelength of light. It's a wavelength of light. Oh, fantastic. So it's a particular wavelength of light, and so to get a proper definition, you have to go back to some mathematical model. Because now you went back to a wave, a wave doesn't exist in this universe. A wave is a mathematical model. Right. And so to the extent that we can be precise about the things that we talk about, we ultimately have to reduce them to mathematical models. Right. Well, that was a side note I was gonna go on that. But, back to this. How do you know something? Do you know anything? And how do you know it? The how do you know it, the part that you explain it, is your reason justifying your conclusion, mm -hmm. right? And so there's, in general, three different types of ways that we can reason to our conclusion. The first type of reasoning, the safest type of reasoning, the only type of reasoning that we allow in fields like logic and mathematics is called deductive reasoning. Let me give you an example of deductive reasoning. I tell you that if all men are mortal, and if Socrates is a man, then what do you know? Socrates is mortal. Then Socrates is mortal. Now notice what I said. I did not say all men are mortal. I did not say Socrates is a man. And I did not say Socrates is mortal. I said, if all men are mortal and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. That's what I said. It's the whole implication that's true. And that's true with capital T. To the extent that you can know anything, you can know that if this is the case, then this is the case. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. We call that deductive reasoning. It's the surest type of reasoning that there is. Now, we have inductive reasoning. What is inductive reasoning? Inductive reasoning is a thinking that it's always happened that way before, so that's the way it's going to happen again. You look at a bunch of particular cases, and based off of all those particular cases, you come to a generalization. You create a generalization from a bunch of particular cases. So, one thing I notice, every time I stop supporting an object, it falls to the ground. So, what's gonna happen if I move my hand out from under this chart. It's going to fall. We know that through inductive reasoning. Did it have to fall to the ground? Yeah. It had to? For all you know, I drilled into this little piece of chalk, stuck a magnet in there, had an electromagnet in the ceiling, and the second I let it go, it actually shoots up to the ceiling. Yeah, well, that's, what that's possible. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to fall to the ground. 
A good thing some magician came ready with a magic trick. That's what magicians do. They subvert your expectations based off of what inductive reasoning tells you should happen. So that doesn't have to happen. And so when you get to inductive reasoning, you're now working in terms of probabilities. This, sure thing, 100% every time. Fairly than 100%, perfect. There's a difference between 100% and always. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't get into that. Inductive reasoning, you're now working in probabilities. Make sense? Yeah. And so we came up here, we said, if all men are mortal, and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. That's what deductive reasoning told us. But now, how do we, what if I want to actually figure out Socrates is mortal? Well, now I need to go check the premise. I need to check, is this true and is this true? How can I check that all men are mortal? If I want to actually check that, I need to do that inductively. Yeah. I go falling around someone, and everyone I fall around, after enough time, they fall over dead. Follow someone else, fall along enough, they fall over dead. Every person I follow, they eventually fall over dead. Conclusion, everyone eventually dies. All men are mortal. So I can validate these things inductively, and then, using deductive reasoning on these premises, come to this conclusion. So very important, inductive reasoning we can use to tell us about this actual universe we're a part of. Deductive reasoning does not tell us about this universe we're a part of. Right. Deductive reasoning tells you that if all men are mortal, and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. It does not tell you anything about man, Socrates, or mortals. Mm -hmm. I could get rid of, I could rephrase this as, if all A's are B, and all B's are C's, then A is a C. And it says the exact same thing. It doesn't care about the fact that we're talking about men, mortals, and Socrates in here. We can replace those with A, B's, and C's, and it's still just as sure as it ever was. So deductive reasoning, very sure thing, completely infallible. However, it can't tell us about this actual universe that we're a part of. We have to rely on inductive reasoning for that. Okay, and then we have abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is the inverse of inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, you take a bunch of particular cases, and create one generalization from it. You see an object fall, you see an object fall, you see an object fall, objects will always fall. Abductive reasoning, you take all your generalizations to reconstruct one specific event. Common example I give is there you are walking down the sidewalk on a cloudy day and you feel a drop on your hand. Your conclusion? It's raining. Oh. Right? That might be one conclusion that you come to. But maybe you look up and you know it's actually right above you, and there's no clouds. So you might think, oh, maybe there's a sprinkler on. You might notice that, oh, there's some sprinklers on over there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're walking next to Jerry. He knows that every time he uses a pee, he just shoots spittle. And you might think, oh, it was probably just a spit. And so you can use your generalizations to try and reconstruct what actually happened in that particular event. Mm -hmm. This is often the type of thinking that we have to use in history. Try to reconstruct a particular event. Often the type of reason you have to use in like court of law, trying to reconstruct a particular event. So inductive, deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning. So now go back to what I said about philosophy. Here's what it seems to catch the heart of philosophy. Philosophy starts by inductively reasoning on common experience to some premises, and then applying logic or deductive reasoning to said premises to come to conclusions in a systematic way. So we don't use inductive reasoning at all? You use inductive and deductive reasoning in philosophy. We don't use abductive. Okay. How logic relates to every other field. Trying to create a chain of dependencies here. So, every field ultimately reduces to logic and relies upon logic to perform any sort of analysis. Logic is largely the only resource the only recourse of analysis we have in philosophy. You want to check whether an argument is valid or not, whether you should accept conclusion or not. Often you have to go back to logic to determine that. You have to, do an anal you have to use logic to perform an analysis of the statements. You can also use your common sense, you can also use your common experience, but you are going to use logic. Yeah. It's largely the only thing you can use for your analysis. So that's why we take such a focus on logic in philosophy. And it's the case for any higher level field. You can pick any high-level field like biology. And you can talk about any fact you want in biology. One fact you might know from biology is that uh, the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. Produces ATP. Now you might ask yourself, well, how exactly does the mitochondria produce ATP? And I learned about something called the electron transport team. Well, that's now chemistry. You might say, how exactly are those electrons being moved down the electron transport team? Well, now we're getting into the realm of physics. 
And in physics, you might say, well, how exactly are those electrons interacting with each other? Well, now you're talking about photons, and now we need to talk about what a photon is. And what a photon is, is fundamentally an electromagnetic wave. What's a wave? It's a mathematical object. We have to reduce it to some sort of mathematical object to talk about it rigorously. And so it reduces to math. And all math is built on top of logic. So it doesn't matter what field you're in, I don't care what it is, you're always allowed to presuppose logic. You could be sitting in your literature class coming up with an interpretation of a poem. It is valid to use logic in that scenario. You could be a historian trying to figure out if Julius Caesar actually crossed the Rubicon. It's valid to use logic. And you could be a mathematician. It's valid to use logic. Always and forever, logic is valid. It's impossible to have a systematic body of knowledge that does not use logic. So we can always use logic. And then finally, logic presupposes a language. You have to be able to talk to, you have to be able to communicate before you can communicate logically. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, so how does acting get fall into the ballpark of logic? <laughs> so one way of summarizing what logic is, is logic is the rules for constructing axiomatic systems. And everything in math and higher is and presupposes axiomatic systems. Yep. But the axioms... Axioms are introduced here. Not here. So there, so it's almost like mathematics is overhanging logic. Some of it's logic. Mathematics uses logic. Math uses logic. Logic does not use math. Well, That's bad reasoning to try and use math to make a logical argument. It's just that it seems like mathematics uses something, uses logic, and then something else. It uses it. So when you're in a system of mathematics, one, drives it forever, allowed to use logic. Two, you're allowed to use the axioms in that system. And those are the two things you use. Yeah. And that's it. Unless you're in some higher field of math, then it's going to be built on other fields of math. So if you're in analytic geometry, you're able to use the axioms on the real numbers and the axioms of Euclidean geometry. It's a field combining two fields of math. I just, I don't know if the analogy is appropriate to say that like mathematics is, is founded on top of logic when there are additional things that it's founded on top of logic. It's only built on logic. Well, I just explain. I, okay, so... If, if logic is the rules for setting up axiomatic systems, and now mathematics we start setting up axiomatic systems, and we say this axiomatic system, this one, this one, and we perform the analysis using logic. Um, to like kind of, I, I don't want to. I mean, there's things in math that don't come into logic the same way that there's things in physics that don't come into math, the same way that there's things in chemistry that don't come into physics, and up we go. But the point is, any biological argument I'm making, I can always and forever use chemistry. The converse is not the case. Any mathematical argument I'm making, I can always and forever use logic. The converse is not the case. I cannot be making some logical argument and say, since every number has a prime factorization, blah, 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 then. Are you saying you can never do it or you can't always do it? It is not a logical argument. There's not an argument of logic if you're using math, because now you're in some axiomatic system, and so the conclusion belongs to that axiomatic system. Yep. Okay. The axioms being the definitions. Now, axiomatic systems are composed of four pieces. An axiomatic system, you have your axioms, you have your undefined terms, you have your definitions, and you have your theorems. These are the components of every axiomatic system. Your axioms are your starting assumptions. They give meaning to your undefined terms. Your undefined terms have no definitions. You use your undefined terms to create definitions, and you put your axioms together logically to create theorems. And so in geometry, you start with Euclid's five postulates. Euclid has a postulate that says, any two points define a line segment. Or given any two points, there's a line segment connecting them. Point and line are undefined terms in Euclidean geometry. What's the definition of a point? Bad question. Whatever it is, it's something that satisfies these five postulates. So these postulates, they use terms, point, line, and plane are our three undefined terms when we're developing, well, and congruence are our undefined terms when we're developing Euclidean geometry. And then we use those to create other definitions. Now I can create a triangle using line segments and I can talk about what that is. Mm -hmm. I use lines, and now triangle has a definition, and we use undefined terms to create definitions. Mm -hmm. Same way we use axioms to prove theorems. 
So I might take this axiom and this axiom and say these two together imply this new statement. If I was in a really, really stupid system, I might have a very stupid system that where my two axioms are Socrates is man and all men are mortal. The only theorem I can prove is Socrates is mortal. It's a very limited system. So in that same way, I can combine these two together. They give me some statement. Maybe these three together give me some new statement. Maybe this statement together with this statement give me some new statement. And everything we're proving out here, these are called theorems. So I use my axioms to ultimately prove my theorems, and I use my undefined terms to define everything else. And everything we define is ultimately defined in a previously defined term, or it goes all the way back to an undefined term. And that's what we mean by an axiomatic system. Every axiomatic system has the same components. It's built that same way. Mm -hmm. So when people make the statement that uh, the whole universe is founded on mathematics, it's a false statement because we're not including the axioms used in physics, chemistry, or biology. A more appropriate way to say that is everything that we know about the universe is in terms of axiomatic systems. And so there's nothing you can say about this universe. If it falls into one of these fields, it falls into some axiomatic system. Like trying to perform an analysis of this universe void of any axiomatic system, it just it doesn't make sense. Even if you just purely have mathematics and its axioms, you cannot describe the world universe or try to uh, simulate it or anything. Well, we can. But we have a different criterion for what constitutes knowing something here than we do here. Right. So physics comes with its own criteria for what we call something is proven, something is true. Yeah. And it's a probabilistic criterion. So it technically could be false. But what it means to know something here is not the same thing as what it means to know something here. Right. Here, when we say we know it, we mean it's impossible for it to be false. Here, when we say we know it, we say that there is this confidence interval that if you perform this experiment, it will come out this way. This is very much defined in terms of observations you will make if you perform this specific experiment. And it's not just... Okay. Uh. <laughs> so, here on out, we're very probabilistic. Yeah. And we lower the criteria, we lower how strict the criteria is for what we consider true. And so a true statement in biology is a far, far, far weaker statement than a true statement in physics. Yeah. Which is a far, far, far weaker statement than a true statement in mathematics. I understand that part. Are there statements between logic and math that have to be the same? Logic and math have to be the same. Right. The difference between logic and math is here we have axioms, here there are no axioms. Right. Okay, so logic doesn't have axioms. Logic does not have axioms. And then, just as a historical note, as we go through this, this connection, that's why Aristotle, when he writes his organon, his first two sections of the organon are called uh, the categories and on interpretation is basically analysis on language. And he uses that to develop the foundations of logic in his prior analytics. And he's the first one to develop logic. And he shows how logic is really at the foundation of science. And so he makes this connection. And then Euclid comes along, and he says, actually, logic is at the foundations of math, kind of. If you're going to say someone did it, he's a good candidate for it. And then Galileo came along, and he said, actually, math is at the foundations of physics. And then I don't know who connected all chemistry produces physics and all biology produces chemistry, but and so the chain of dependencies was created. So a little bit of a historical note. But that's why Aristotle is one of the two giants that we'll cover in this class. Well, three guys, but one of them isn't in most philosophy classes. That'll be Euclid. So, logic, very important, very important particularly for us studying philosophy because it's pretty much the only recourse of analysis we have. So now we're gonna get into logic. Logic is kind of a catch-all term. What we really mean when we say logic is we mean there's propositional logic. Sorry, should have wrote that at the bottom. On top of propositional logic, we build predicate logic. And then on top of that, we build logic with identity. And it's usually the whole package thing that we call just logic. But technically, it's splitting up these three ways. So we'll start first with propositional logic. Then we'll get to predicate logic. Then we'll get to logic with identity. Identity being like the equal sign. Basically just introducing equals into your logic. So start with propositional logic, where it all begins. 
<laughs> so propositional logic, we're interested in a statement. We're interested in statements. Things that actually assert things. Yeah. So a statement is a sentence that is either true or false, but not both. Now, I'll accidentally use sentence and statement interchangeably here. Every time from here on out, I say sentence or statement. I mean, some sentence that's either true or false, not both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notation, we typically use Greek letters like alpha and beta to represent statements. Question, which of the following here are statements? Go back home. No. no. Two times two equals five. No. Mm -hmm. Two times two equals five? Yes. Well, it's, well, it's a statement. Okay. <laughs> two times two equals four. Yeah. Yes. New York is a suburb of Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a statement. Thursday up tar paper. No. Now, the silliness is speedily. No. no. Now, I am the most beautiful girl in town. Yeah. yeah. X plus two equals five. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. X plus two equals five. It's not true yes. or false, yeah. We don't know what X is. No. Wonderful. No. So sure. some of you who have been to this before aren't completely regressing. <laughs> this is not a proposition. Right, so this is our first example of a predicate. We will have a lot more to say about these things. Okay. But, for those of you who this is your first time, until we know what X is, we can't classify this as true or false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it depends upon what X is. Once you have an X, then you can call it true or false. Mm -hmm. So if it had a particular X in here, then it would become a proposition. Right now it's just a predicate. A predicate is something that if you give it a term, it turns into a proposition. Okay. So that's jumping ahead to predicate. Now I'll also use Proposition all the time. Proposition, statement, sentence, I mean them all the same way. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the technicality. Technically, every statement is a proposition, not every proposition is a statement. What's a proposition? It's anything that can be true or false, but not both. Mm -hmm. Typically, we're interested in actual sentences, oh. and so statement is restricting us to just talking about sentences. Okay. But technically, a proposition doesn't care what the thing is. As long as it's something that's either true or false, not both, it's a proposition. Every boolean is just a proposition. Really? Yes. But it's not a statement? No. A boolean doesn't have to be a statement. Why is it not a statement? True. False. I don't know. Does that make it not a statement? I don't know. Is x plus 2 equals but 5 a statement? No. x plus 2 equals 5 is not a statement. But it is a proposition. It's not a proposition. It's not a statement. What is it's it? the first example of what we call a predicate. So we'll get to those. We'll have a lot more to say about those later. But right now we're on propositional logic. But 2 times 2 equals 4 is not a sentence, right? No, but that's a sentence. A that's a statement. That's good. So okay. Everything that we're going to see in this class is going to be statements. What is a sentence, then? <laughs> we're not going to define everything as we go. <laughs> we're going to rely on your intuition for a sentence to give you a good intuition for a statement. Technically, a statement is just a type of proposition, but we'll go ahead and pretend that they're all the same thing. This is meant to be a quick crash course on logic. The full-fledged deep dive of logic we already did, that's a class in and of itself. We can't do that. <laughs> okay. So, can't come at this completely sententially. Anyway, so that's a statement. Now we have what are called sentential connectives. Don't overthink these. These are very simple. These are the terms or phrases that can be connected onto a sentence in a meaningful way. Anything you can connect onto a sentence and still have it be a sentence, we're good. That's all it is. There's infinitely many of these things. So I'll give you examples. Not, and, or, Jack believes. It is probably the case that. If blank, then blank. If and only if, etc. These are some examples. Let's give you examples using these. Let alpha be the statement, the sky is green. Let beta be the statement, two plus two is four. Now consider this. The sky is green and two plus two is four. Is that a meaningful sentence? Yeah. yeah. Then and is a sentential connective. The sky is green or 2 plus 2 is 4. Meaningful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sentence of connected. If the sky is green, then 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Still meaningful. Still mm -hmm. sentence. So if then, perfectly valid, sentence of connected. Just things you can use to connect sentences in meaningful ways so the result is still a sentence. Very simple. Jack believes the sky is green. It's completely meaningful. You know what it's saying. It's not gibberish. Well, it's this is a very low criterion to be a sentence of connected. Okay. It just doesn't come out gibberish. It still is meaningful. It's still a sentence. Gotcha. It is probably the case that 2 plus 2 is 4. Yep. Completely meaningful. These are all examples of sentential connectives. Okay. It doesn't take anything impressive for you to come up with a sentential connective. Okay. That's not a sentence. Okay. I'll take 
Gibberish. Well, we don't care about not non-suspensive connectives, but yeah, gibberish would be an example. What is not a word? Gibberish. Kite flew helicopter up there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Just gibberish. Okay. Now we're going to focus in on a particular sentential connective, one that we really like in logic, and we call that the conjunction. So we construct we can construct new statements by combining existing statements. I could have taken New York as a su suburb of Los Angeles, and I am the most beautiful girl in town. Just connected two statements together using one of these sentential connectives. The particular one we use is called and. So now we define conjunction. If alpha and beta are statements, so if alpha is something that I can call true or false, and beta is something that I can for sure call true or false. So if alpha and beta are statements, the statement alpha and beta is called the conjunction of alpha and beta. Now, those of you who have taken this from me a few times, you better take issue with that definition. I said, if alpha and beta are statements, then the statement alpha and beta is called the conjunction of alpha and beta. How do I know that alpha and beta is a statement? Just because I know I can call alpha true or false, and just because I know I can call beta true or false, how on earth do I know that I can call alpha and beta true or false? There's a truth table. And the truth table is how we justify that. So, has anyone not seen a truth table before? I'm not seeing a truth table. Wonderful. So I have two statements, alpha and beta. So I have a statement alpha and a statement beta. This one can be like, the sky is blue. This one can be 2 plus 2 is 4. Something like that. We know that alpha is either true or false. It's a statement. That's all it can be. I know that beta is either true or false. It's a statement. That's all it can be. So now the possible combinations I can have in these two statements, I can have it in the case that alpha is a true statement and beta is a true statement. I can have it in the case that alpha is a true statement and beta is a false statement. I can have it in the case that alpha is false and beta is true. Or I can have that they're both false. And these are all the possible combinations for two statements. Good so far? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to look at alpha and beta. You'll get used to these symbols. That upside down V right there is the and symbol. So alpha and beta. Now if you know that alpha is true and you know that beta is true, then alpha and beta is true. That's right. If you know that alpha is true and beta is false, then alpha and beta is false. false. Good. And if alpha is false and beta is true, then alpha and beta is false. false. And then if they're both the same, then it's true. still false. Glad I sucked someone in. <laughs> still false. False and false is false. Why? I tell you that I am a trillionaire. And I own the biggest mansion in town. Is that statement true? No. Because I told you two false statements. And I can join them together. Oh. So they're false. So a false statement, a false statement, still a false statement. But they, uh, okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, you'll quickly catch up. Okay, so there's and. Let's play with another uh, perfectly fine sentence or connected. Or. No, we'll get there. What about other conjunctions like the word but? Let's look at alpha but beta. Let's try and come up with a way to assign this a value. If alpha is true and beta is true, then alpha but beta is true. true. It's going to be true. If they're both true, then alpha but beta is going to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. right. oh. Let's uh, make this very clear. Alpha is Donnie's holding chalk. Beta is Donnie's holding a marker. I set up so that they're both true. Yeah. Donnie's holding Chuck, but he's holding a marker. True or false? True. True. Well, not holding a marker. Er, eraser, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. True. I do this too much with markers. <laughs> okay, muscle memory rather than thinking. All right, let's set the next scenario. Donnie's holding Chuck, but Donnie's holding an eraser. That's false. False. Donnie's holding Chuck, but Donnie's holding an eraser. False. 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 That's true. What? He wasn't holding Chuck. Oh, uh, there's nothing in my hand. <laughs> yeah. It looks like you were holding Chuck. The light from the projector making it white. Yeah. Not holding anything. <laughs> Donnie's holding Chuck, but Donnie's holding an eraser. False. 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 Donnie's holding Chuck, but Donnie's holding an eraser. False. 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 So you'll notice that, but we ended up giving the exact same values to it that we gave and. Now, read these two statements and tell me if they say the exact same thing. 
I love you and I love your brother. I love you, but I love your brother. No. Do they all say the same thing or do they all say different things? Different. They're different. But is different from and. And we know that but is different from and. But why is it and yet, logically, they say the exact same thing. <laughs> what does this mean? This means this word but, it does not have a precise definition. And is perfectly well defined. We know exactly what and means. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we can perfectly define but, it comes out the same as and, and yet we know that they're different. And so there are words in the English language that are inherently ambiguous. Right. And so one way you can think about logic is logic is getting at the completely unambiguous parts of language. Right. We want to cut away all the ambiguous parts and leave only those things that it's completely understood exactly what that's saying. That's what logic's after. Uh -huh. So and is a word that we use in logic. But... Not so much. It's ambiguous. It's a much better word for a poem. Write a poem, use a but. It's not a joke. Poems, by definition, are supposed to be ambiguous, open to interpretation. But is more ambiguous than and. It's a better word for a poem. This is a much better word if we're trying to do a rigorous analysis. So, we're not after every word. We don't care about every sentential connective. But one of the things we care about with our sentential connectives is that they're univocal. They're well-defined. They mean one and only one thing, and we know exactly what it is that they mean. Okay. Let's continue our logic now. Just, um, hang on for a second. If we said X um, alpha but beta, and you're saying that this is in fact the, the true statement, but in, in the previous one where it says, uh, I love you, but I love my brother, they're both true statements, but they end up basically saying false, falsifying the whole thing, wouldn't it? They don't falsify. We we just know that, but is somehow saying that the two that alpha is somehow connected to beta. Yeah, it's like an if then kind of thing. It's, it's not like an if then. If then is a perfectly logical thing. Well, okay, it's not what I'm going to say. I'm saying it's uh, Oops. where there's a connection. Is my point. Yeah, somehow when I say when when the girl tells you I love you, but I love your brother. She's saying, this somehow uh, qualifies this thing over here. It somehow has an effect on it. Okay. Yeah. And what exactly is that effect? No, Make it exactly precise. You can't. This but doesn't have a precise definition. To the extent that you want to be completely logical about the word but, you have to make it identical to and. And yet, intuitively, as human beings, we know that but and and are very different things. Hmm. So that is why we would not allow a word like but into our language of logic, but we... And we allow this word and into it. Okay. All right. So that's like giving you uh, one of our criteria for uh, the pieces of language that we're pulling out. Are you saying but isn't a sentential connective? No, it is. But is a sentential connective. There's infinitely many sentential connectives. We are interested in a very specific few. So I was trying to help you understand how even though but is something that we can create a truth table for, and but is a sentential connective, is still one that we don't care about because of that inherent ambiguity. So we want to stick with words that are completely unambiguous. The second thing we want to stick with, so in logic, we are only interested in the univocal parts of language. That's one only one meaning, no ambiguity to it. That's what I was saying there. Our second thing that we care about is we want our, we only care about the sentential connectives that are truth functional sentential connectives. What are these sentential connectives? Truth functional sentential connectives are sentential connectives where the truth or falsity of the resulting statement, of the whole thing, can be completely determined by knowing the truth or falsity of the component statements. Notice that if you knew the truth and falsity of alpha and beta here, you were able to perfectly determine the truth or falsity of alpha and beta. Now I'm going to make up a new symbol. And this new symbol is a symbol for Jack believes. I tell you, Alpha is true. Is it true that Jack believes Alpha is true? Or will you use Beta here? Yes. Beta is the sky is blue. I tell you now, Jack believes the sky is blue. True or false? True. I don't know. Jack, no, he doesn't believe it. I was talking to him. He's giving us a screen. We had a conversation just the other day. Say that again. Say that. All right, so this fancy symbol right here is our shorthand for Jack believes. Yeah. All right, so let's so start with the sky's blue. Beta is the sky's blue, okay. which is a true statement. What's alpha? Forget alpha for a second. All we care about right now is beta. So maybe that's our new. Yeah, that's what it was. Okay, so let's do alpha here. 
Alpha is a statement that can either be true or false. All right, make up a symbol for Jack believes. I don't want to accidentally use something that looks like alpha again. Let's do the square. No, we'll do the square. That square means Jack believes alpha. So I'll pick a true statement. The sky's blue. Does Jack believe the sky's blue? True or false? Nope, he does. Jack believes the sky's blue. No, no, no. Nope, he does. And the answer is, it's not true, it's functional. I can't determine the truth or falsity of this strictly by knowing this. Yes. Up here, I can perfectly determine the truth or falsity of this knowing its component statements. Here, I can't. So Jack believes is not a truth functional sentential connective. It's a sentential connective. You can give me any statement. Give me any statement. Wait, I don't know. And I can add on, Jack believes, wait, I don't know. And it still makes as much sense as it did before. We can add that on just fine. So it's a perfectly valid sentential connective, but it's not a truth functional sentential connective. So we're interested in two types of connectives here. One, I have one and only one definition, and two, they're truth functional. Or in other words, we can create a truth table for it. If you can't create a truth table for it, it's not truth functional. We can't fill out this truth table. There's no way to know. We can this one. Not truth functional, is truth functional. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so examples. Let alpha and beta be two statements. Which connectives are truth functional? Jack believes alpha. Is that truth functional? No. No, we just went over that one in quite good detail. It is not true that alpha. Yeah. Not no. Yeah, that's truth functional. If I tell you alpha oh. is true, then it is not true that alpha is false. Yeah. And you're able to completely determine that. Okay. Okay. On the other hand, if alpha is false, then when I say it is not true that alpha, then the result is true. And you're able to completely determine it. Okay. And we actually have a fancy symbol for it is not true then. Okay. And it's this little symbol, yeah. the not symbol. Yeah. It's a long way of saying not alpha. Yeah. But we'll get to negation. <laughs> Next one, alpha and beta. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If I know alpha and I know beta, I can perfectly determine the truth and falsity of alpha and beta. It is probable that beta. No. no. Beta could be, I won the lottery. Just because I won the lottery doesn't mean that I was probable that I would win the lottery. Unprobable things are true and probable things are true. Right. Okay. So, not truth functional versus truth functional. If it's truth functional, we should be able to construct a truth table for it. So, that's the basic test for is this truth functional? Can you create a truth table? Then, yes. If not, no. Okay, so that gives you a taste for the sentential connections that we're interested in. These ones that are well-defined, completely unambiguous, and they're truth functional. Is there anything else besides and 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 not? There's a bunch of them. Okay. We're going to limit ourselves to common five because they're enough to reconstruct the other ones that we need as we need them. Okay. But the common five are going to be and or not implies and if and only if for equivalence. Okay, so moving on to the next one, disjunction now. If alpha and beta are statements, the statement alpha or beta, notice I called that statement, so it better be truth functional, or it better be truth functional. The statement alpha or beta is called the disjunction of alpha and beta. It is false if both alpha and beta are false, otherwise it's true. So, the or symbol, by the way, is this V now, and that comes from... The Latin word for or is like vel or something like that. Really? Yeah. So that's what it comes from. And obviously our logic that we have now was ultimately translated from Latin. I don't know if there's something to go all the way back to the Greek. But anyways, now what did this say? It said, it is false if both alpha and beta are false, otherwise it's true. So if we're filling out the truth table for or here, it's false if both alpha and beta are false, otherwise it's true. True, true, true. Yes. So we'll make alpha, I'm holding a chalk. Beta, I'm holding an eraser. Is it true that I'm holding a chalk or an eraser? Yes. Yes. Is it true that I'm holding a chalk or an eraser? Yes. Yes. Is it true that I'm holding a chalk or an eraser? Yes. Is it true that I'm holding a chalk or an eraser? No. So it was only false in the case where both alpha and beta were false, otherwise it was true. So there's your intuition for it. Now, we run into a little bit of trouble in English. Logic is much older than English. Logic was not developed using English. And so, huh? Can you say that again? Logic is much older than English. Logic was not developed using English. Yes, oh, Aristotle mean, predates the English language. Oh, you know what you mean? I thought, okay, I thought you language. Okay, sorry. Talk about the English language, yes. 
So in English, we use or two ways. We use it in what we call the inclusive sense, and we use it in what we call the exclusive sense. The inclusive sense. I say, you must take physics or calculus to apply for my class. If you take both physics and calculus, can you apply for my class? Yes. Sir. Yes. Now, the waiter comes to you, you order a burger, and they say, that order comes with a side of salad or soup. And you say, both. Yeah. No, you didn't, both wasn't an option. You get the salad and not the soup, or you get the soup and not the salad. They meant it in the exclusive way, in the one that excludes this top one. So you like inclusive. So when we use or in logic, we specifically mean the inclusive or. If you care about the exclusive or, it's a perfectly valid truth functional sentential connective that we can use in logic. The exclusive or, it's the same symbol but has a line through it, alpha or beta, and its truth table is false, true, true, false. It means one and only one is true. Whereas this or means at least one is true. So, not a very common one. We don't use exclusive or very often, but it's perfectly fine, perfectly valid. You can use it if you want, nothing wrong with it. It's just, as a matter of course, we choose not to use it as much. Okay. Uh, now, if we want to use the exclusive or, we can write XOR for that symbol. Okay. Gotcha. Need to move those flies. <clears throat> All right. Next one. Negation. Probably the easiest one, but one that will for sure trip you up. So what is the negation of the statement? If alpha is a statement, the statement alpha is false is called the negation of alpha. We also just say it not alpha. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, write its truth table really quick. So we're talking about a single statement this time, alpha. And alpha can either be true or false. And if alpha is true, then not alpha is false. false. And if alpha is false, then not alpha is true. true. So if a statement is true, its negation is guaranteed to be false. And if a statement is false, its negation is guaranteed to be true. What's the negation of x equals 4? x is not equal to 4. That's its negation. One of those has to be true and one of those has to be false. I say it's x4, you say no. Okay, then x is not 4. I say, so x is not 4, you say no. Well, then x had to be 4. Right. These are negations of each other. Okay. If this is true, this has to be false. If this is true, this has to be false. Okay. All right. <coughs> so. Da, 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 da. Uh... Notation, we write not alpha as not alpha. <coughs> no, not alpha is the contradiction of alpha. We always know that either alpha is true or that not alpha is true. Oh. oh, we always know that either alpha is true and not alpha is false or that alpha is false and not alpha is true. Okay, that's the grammar of that. That makes sense? Yeah. So it's either alpha is true and not alpha is false, or alpha is false and not alpha is true. Mm -hmm. okay. Always and forever has to be one of those two cases if alpha is a statement. No way around it. Okay, so let's make sure we're understanding this. Which of the following are negations of this statement? All the swans are white. So we're looking for the negation of that. And so yes or no, this negates it. Some swans are black. No, no. no. Yeah. yeah, that negates it. Yeah. Look, if all swans aren't white, then some swans have to be black. Yeah. No. no. I could live in a universe of all yellow swans. Imagine every swan's yellow. Is it true that all swans are white? No. no. no? Okay. So some swans have to be black. <laughs> no, they're all yellow. Okay. So this is not the negation of this. Right. These are contrary statements. They can't both be true. That's very different from the negation. Mm -hmm. This is an easy trap to fall into. So it has to be actually. If alpha is true, no alpha has to be false. And if alpha is false, not alpha has to be true. Okay. So the only way that this can be the negation of that is anytime this is true, this is false. And anytime this is true, this is false. Okay. All right, so let's try another one. All swans are white, at least one swan is black. 
Oh, again, we could live in a universe of all yellow swans. Okay. All swans are white. Some swans are not white. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. If it is not the case that all swans are white, then some swans are not white. <laughs> On the other hand, if some swans are not white, then all swans are white are false. So if this is true, this is false. And if this is true, this is false. They're negations of each other. Let's try another one. All swans are white. Not all swans are white. Yes. Yeah, that's about as simple a negation as you can do. Take a statement, put a not in front of it. You negate it. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> that's all we did. All swans are white or not all swans are white. Yeah. We're guaranteed one of those statements is true and one of those statements is false. Uh -huh. They're negations of each other. All swans are white. Every swan is not white. No. Yeah, that's right. No, because some swans, some swans could be not white. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. So we can live in a universe of half white, half black. Are some swans white? Or are all swans white? No. Okay, then every swan is not white. Oh, no, it's just half of them are white. Yeah, you're right. So it's not a negation. So not a negation. Only these two were actual negations. The rest of those are just contrary statements. Okay. Huge difference between a contrary statement and a negation. Negation is very tricky, and it's real easy to get tripped up by. We said the conversation with opposite. A lot of people use the opposite, and it actually means one of these. Things. <laughs> so we'll eventually get to opposites, Aristotle's analysis on opposites, and he breaks it down by what people mean in different cases. <laughs> and sometimes they mean the actual negation, and sometimes they don't. And what was the other word again? Because if I ask you, what's the, what's the opposite of black? White. White. Yeah, I say, what's the negation of black? Not black. Yeah, all the other colors. Which is any other color but black. Yeah. That's the negation of black. I see. So very different. But sometimes the opposite is a negation. Depending on how it's used. Well, opposite is just some intuition we have in our heads for what we're saying. Okay. And so I'm saying sometimes your intuition for what opposite means gives you the negation, and sometimes it doesn't. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. The contrary is an actual word that you use for basically anything that invalidates the statement or Yes. Great. Contrary statements are statements that can't both be true. Okay. So contradictory statements are contrary statements. But with contradictions, one's for sure true and one's for sure false. With contrary statements, they can both be false, but at least one of them is false. One and only one is false, at least one is false. Okay, let's get comfortable staying the negation of statements, thinking about their negation. Just say it out loud. So, state the negation of each of the following. All men in Georgia are at least six feet tall. Not all men in Georgia are at least six feet tall. Yeah, you can just add the not in front of there. That's the easy way to do it. Not all men in Georgia are at least six feet tall. Or we could have said some men in Georgia are less than six feet tall. Right. Well, uh, that are not six feet tall. All men in Georgia are at least six feet tall. Some men in Georgia are less than six feet tall. Right? Next one. All students in France like Germany. Or like geometry. And don't just say a not. Some students in France like geometry. There exists a student in France that does not like geometry. There is at least one student in France that does not like geometry. Or some students in France do not like geometry. That's negation of it. Okay, next one. Every rectangle is square. Every rectangle is a square. What's the negation of that? There exists a rectangle that is not square. Yeah, some rectangles are not squares. What? Oh, yeah. Every circle has a center. There some circles don't have a center. Some circles don't have a center. That's the negation of that. Mm -hmm. Either every circle has a center or some don't. One of those has to be true, one of those has to be false. Yeah. <laughs> For every pair of numbers, A and B, A plus B is equal to B plus A. There exists a pair of numbers where A plus B is not equal to B plus A. Perfect. There exists some pair of numbers A and B such that A plus B is not equal to B plus A. Next one. Some men play golf. All. Some men play There exists play a man that does not play golf. No, all men, men play golf. golf. No, men no play men play golf. No. For all men, it is not the case that they play golf. Yes. And for all not the case, it's the same thing as none. For all men, it is not the case that they play golf. Or in other words, no men play golf. Yes. 
And finally, there's at least one number x such that x plus 3 is equal to 7. There's at least one number x such that x is not equal to 7. Great <laughs> numbers. Not quite. <laughs> There is at least one number x such that x plus 3 equals 7. Every, for every x, x plus 3 does not equal 7. And for every x, x plus 3 does not equal 7. Either there's one number that satisfies that, or there isn't. Either there's at least one number that satisfies that, or there's no numbers that satisfy it. One of those has to be the case, and one of those has to not be the case. Yeah. Either there's at least one number that makes it true, or there's no numbers that make it true. Right. Um. So this uh, sum and play golf is kind of interesting because you could, if, it, if there was a statement, all men play golf, then some men play golf would be a negation of all men play golf. Nope. No. All men play golf. Let's assume that all men play golf. Is it true that all men play golf? Sure. Yeah. Is it true that some men play golf? Yes. Yes. Huh. Let's so, say that we live in a universe where all men play golf. So this is true. This is also still true. If all men play golf, then it's true that some men play golf. Do some men play golf? Yeah, they all do. Well, okay, so if we go back up to the top statement, all men in Georgia are at least, uh, are at least six foot tall. Can you say some men in Georgia are at least six tall, feet tall? Because that would not be negation, what you're saying. No, the negation of this would be some men in Georgia are less than six feet tall. Yes, okay, that could be one. So you're saying some, saying some, our way of negating all men. No, you can't just say some. You need to say some instead of all, and then say the opposite of what said before. Yes. So, yeah. oh, I see. Some negates all, and then you have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of. That's for every and there's just. I don't know if we'll go over how to distribute a not over a for all quantifier. Uh -huh. But, well, we haven't seen the quantifiers yet. They're not right. <laughs> <laughs> They're special symbols. They're in. in We'll get to them. Oh, yeah. If you did my topology, you've seen them all over the place because, yeah, I can't help but write them. So I'll introduce them and I'll write them throughout the class. All right. Uh, example. Negate each conjunction. All right. Let's try to negate a conjunction. Today is Monday and the weather is cold. State the negation. Today is Tuesday and the weather is warm. Today is Tuesday and the weather is warm. That's the negation of that. Because either today's Monday and the weather's cold or today's Tuesday and the weather's warm. One of those has to be true, one of those has to be false. Because it can never be Wednesday. That's impossible. It's either Monday with cold weather or Tuesday with warm weather. Yeah. <laughs> no, it could be Wednesday. Wednesday's a perfectly good day. So that's not the negation. Try again. <laughs> Today is Monday and the weather is cold. We're trying to state the negation of it. It is not Monday and the weather is not cold. Today is not Monday and the weather is not cold. That's what he thinks is the negation. Isn't that? <laughs> that's the con. Is that the con positive? No, con positive has to implication. We're not there yet. Well, that's so true. you're getting close. So you're saying today is not Monday. Oh, that's right. Okay. And the weather is not cold, right? Uh, let's it, pretend. Well, right. if you swap it, then it wouldn't. Let's pre let's stick with your example. You're getting close. Let's pretend that today's Tuesday and the weather is cold. Okay. So let's pretend today's Tuesday and the weather's cold. Is it true that today's Monday and the weather's cold? No. No. Okay, so then it must be true that today is not Monday and the weather is not cold. No. Well, no. Cold. So it doesn't? Because today the weather's cold yeah. and it's Tuesday. So what's the negation of this? You use an or. You use an or. Replace the oh. and with an or. Yeah. Um, so you negate this, you negate this, and you switch your and for an or. Oh, you have to do the whole thing. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, okay. That makes, that makes now that's the negation. So either today is Monday and the weather's cold, or it's going to be the case that today is not Monday or the weather is not cold. Yep. Okay. One of those has to be true, one of those has to be false. Good? Okay, right, let's try another one. All cats are black and all men are mortal. There exists a cat that is not black, or there exists a man that is mortal. Perfect. Or an easier way to say that is some cats are not black, or some men are immortal. Good. Next one. 
Some rectangles are square and some triangles are equilateral. Every rectangle is a square or every rectangle is equilateral? Almost. Or not equilateral? Is it equilateral? Is it equilateral? Is it square? So you mess up here. What did I say? You said, you said all rectangles are squares. Are squares. So oh, not squares, sorry. all rectangles are not squares or all triangles are not equilateral. This is a negation, right? Okay, moving on to the next one. Some widgets are gadgets and no wiggles are riders. <laughs> Notice how you can negate it even when you have gibberish shown in there. We can still negate this. So what's the opposite of some wiggles are, what's the negation of some wiggles are gadgets? All widgets are not gadgets. Well, all, all widgets are not gadgets or no widgets are gadgets. Yeah. So it's no widgets are gadgets or some wiggles are wackles. Some, yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right. And note, what are we saying? We're saying if you want to negate alpha and beta, then what you end up with is not alpha or not beta. And so in language, what we were doing is we were showing how to distribute a not over an and, and it turns it into an or. So let's write out the truth table for this really quick. So we have alpha and beta here. I'm going to write not alpha and beta. So not alpha and beta. And then, over here, we're going to, oh, let's switch this for an hand, which means we got to switch these. False, false. Okay. And now we're going to look at not alpha or not beta. With me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, not alpha and beta is just negating alpha and beta. So, if alpha and beta is true, not alpha and beta is false. If it's false, then we get true. False, we get true. False, we get true. Make sense? Yep. Now over here, we're doing not alpha or not beta. So false or false is false. false. Now false or true is true. True. Okay. true or false is true. true. And true or true is true. true. And notice that you get identical things. So they're logically equivalent. Now we spit out the exact same thing. Okay. So we just made sure this is logically equivalent to this, and we got comfortable with how to use it in language. Okay. Now, we won't spend too much time on disjuncting, doing the negating a disjunction, but it's the same principle. You replace your or with an and, and you negate the two. So I will study hard, or I will fail. What's the negation of that? What's the negation of I will study hard or I will fail? Imagine I tell you, you say, you will study hard or you will fail. And you say, that's not true. I will, what are you saying? I will not study hard and I will not fail. Yeah, you're saying, I won't study hard and I won't fail. Watch me. Right? That's what you're saying. So you're saying not this. So you're not over here. You switch your or to an and, and then you're not this. Same principle. And so this shows us that not alpha or beta is the same thing as not alpha and not beta. And we won't bother writing out the truth table for that. Good? Yep. All right, and we'll skip this not versus never. I was going to show that never is kind of to not what but is to yeah. and. Telling, introducing why we don't use never in logic as well. But I think we kind of got that. So moving forward. Proofs. So when we're reading philosophical arguments, they're attempting to prove something. That's what they're going to be trying to do. So let's talk a little bit about what these proofs are. When we try to convince someone of the validity of some statement, then we say, this is true because that is true. That is the reason we believe this. How do we prove that? We well, we'll get to it. But if they agree that that is true, so if you agree with the that, and you agree that that implies this, then you have to agree with my this. Yes. So in other words, if you agree with my premise and you agree with my argument, then you have to agree with my conclusion. And that's what you do in a proof. I try to find some premise that you'll accept and then walk you through some reasoning that you view as valid, typically using deductive reasoning, and get you to a conclusion that you can then accept. Is it possible to prove something absolutely? Like it's just true? Yes. Yeah. Every single thing that we prove in logic and math is truth with capital T. It's true to the extent that the concept of truth makes any sense. If we believe the axioms. No. Because in math, we never say the axioms are true. I never say all men are mortal. I never say Socrates is a man. 
I say, if all men are moral, and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is moral. So in mathematics, we never say the axioms are true. This is something that philosophers screw up all the time when they talk about math. No. We, mathematicians never say the axioms are true. They say the axioms imply the theorems. The implication is what's true. Yes. That's true with capital T. We demonstrate the implication is a tautology, something that's always true. We call them tautological implications. Well, I'm saying, like, with no, like, can we prove that man is mortal, Socrates is a man, so Socrates is mortal? No, we cannot prove... For example, all men are mortal. There is no proof with capital P that all men are mortal. The way you have to validate that is with inductive reasoning. What we know with capital T is that if all men are mortal and if Socrates is man, then Socrates is mortal. That whole implication we know with capital T. Knowing all men are mortal, we'll never know that with capital T. That relies on inductive reasoning, which relies on probabilistic reasoning. Yeah, so we can't prove. Unless it's an if, then. So there's no such thing as T with capital T, truth with capital T, in any of the sciences. You get in logic, you get in math. And that's it. You don't get in science. You don't get in history. You don't get in philosophy. You don't get in any of those other fields. Okay. So, roughly, I keep giving you all these high-level ways that we can think about logic. Here's another way. Logic can be summarized as a study of the rules for making correct statements. It's the rules for the valid ways that we can put statements together to come to other true statements. Okay. Now, proofs always consist of statements of the form, if so-and-so is true, then such-and-such such must also be true. They can always take on that form. If they're not worded in that form, I can always rework them to put them in that form. Any theorem you know and love, it fits in that form. Your Pythagorean theorem. What's the Pythagorean theorem say? No. The two legs of the triangle, when they're squared and put together, equal half the right. triangle squared. So, to set it up in the way that he wants to say it, we say that if you have a right triangle, and the lengths of the legs are A and B, and the length of the hypotenuse is C, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yes. That's what the whole theorem says. And so it says, if a bunch of things, then our conclusion. Okay. Every theorem can always be phrased in this if-then terminology. Always and forever. It may not be phrased that way, but it can always be reworked in a logically equivalent way that is phrased that way. Now, some proofs that you've done several times, but you just didn't know it. You did proofs like, I give you 3x equals 4, and I tell you to solve for x. Then you get x is equal to 4 thirds. If 3x equals 4, then x is equal to 4 thirds. Okay. If a is equal to 2 and b is equal to 3, then a squared plus ab is equal to 10. Now let's check it. Plug in 2 for a, you get 4. Plug in 3 for b, 2 times 3 is 6, 4 plus 6 is 10. Okay, yay, it worked. So every time you were told to solve a problem in math, it could have been rephrased in this if-then form. So that if this is the case, then that is the case. It's what's always after. So all proofs are in the form, or can be written into the form, if alpha, then beta. We call alpha the antecedent, or the condition, and we call beta the conclusion, or the consequent. So that would be common terminology. Let's look at the, I may use antecedent a lot and conclusion a lot. Those are the ones I use the most. Maybe antecedent's a new word for you. You'll have to get used to it. I use it all the time. It's just the perfect way to say it. Okay, so now we get to the most confusing part of propositional logic, implications. So what's implication? If alpha and beta are statements, the statement alpha implies beta, is called the implication. We may also say, instead of saying alpha implies beta, we could have phrased it if alpha then beta. We could have also phrased it beta if alpha. We could have also phrased it alpha only if beta. We could have also phrased it alpha is a special condition for beta. And we could have also phrased it beta is a necessary condition for alpha. And unfortunately, in your philosophical text, in your math text, in your science text, all these verbiages of implication come up all the time. And you gotta get comfortable with all of them. Chances are you've seen a bunch of these in your text already. And so it's good to understand exactly what they mean. Now, how do we write it? The notation we use is alpha implies beta. The way we write that is alpha arrow over beta. So we have our and symbol. We have our or symbol. We have our not symbol. Now we have our imply symbol. Is it a single arrow or a double arrow? The double arrow is your if and only if or your logical equivalent. So this will be the last symbol that we introduce. Those will be our five symbols of propositional line. logic that is we use all the time. One straight line or two straight lines? Uh, 
depends on your font. Both these go both ways. Sometimes people do it like that and like that. I always do that simply because it's shorter. But when I type up a proof, I'm not sure which one even I use. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, Let's for examples. Put the following into an if alpha then beta form. So you're trying to rephrase these in this if alpha then beta form. I tell you, if I eat strawberries, I get hives. If I eat strawberries, then I get hives. If I eat strawberries, then I get hives. Okay? Pretty straightforward. People who don't study mathematics don't have good sense. If you don't study mathematics, then you don't have good sense. Perfect. The crops will be saved if we have rain this week. Perfect. It will rain tomorrow only if it gets cold. If it gets cold, then it will rain tomorrow. Is it saying if it gets cold, it will rain tomorrow? Or is it saying if it rains tomorrow, oh. then it got cold? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. If it will rain tomorrow, then it got Which cold. Which one's the antecedent? Is this the antecedent? Are we saying this implies this? No, so no. which way does our implication arrow go? Is it saying this implies this, or is it saying this it implies will, this? It will rain tomorrow is our antecedent. No. It will rain tomorrow is our antecedent. You're saying, no, this is our antecedent. Yeah. Do we have a tiebreaker? If it, it gets cold, cold, it can be cold and not rain. If it gets cold, you think is the antecedent. So you think that? It's saying the only way it'll rain is if it gets cold. Yeah, okay. It can get cold. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll perfectly convince everyone. <laughs> 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 so, it will rain tomorrow is the antecedent. Not so, really. I promise you I'll convince you. I promise. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you that this implies this. We're saying if this is the case, then this is the case. And I'm going to use different terminology. This is a very easy one to get confused. So there is oxygen if there is fire. Is that true or false? Not true. There's oxygen if there's fire. Yes. It's true. It's saying there being fire implies there's oxygen, right? Yes. True or false? There is fire only if there's oxygen. That's the same thing. True. This is saying fire implies oxygen. So up here, the implication arrow was going fire implies oxygen. Down here, this was saying fire implies oxygen. And so you know, notice that if you put an only in front of your if, it swaps the way the implication goes. Right. Yes. So when I write alpha if beta, if I say alpha if beta, this is the same thing as beta implies alpha. If I write alpha only if beta, then this is saying alpha implies beta. Okay. So putting the only flops away, we're saying the implication goes. Right. Up here, the implication was going right to left. Down here, the implication was going left to right. And the only thing we changed was putting the only in there. Right. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no? Only if. Flips it. So here, take it one more time. True or false? There is oxygen if there is fire. True. Wait, 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 wait. That's a true statement. Yeah, that's there's true. oxygen if there's fire. It, okay. It, um, it's saying if there's fire, then there's oxygen. Yeah, this is saying if there's fire, then there's oxygen. Okay. Logically equivalent, but Got there's that. oxygen if there's fire. This is true. Yeah. And the implication here is going backwards, this way. Now true or false? There's fire only if there's oxygen. It's also true. It's also true. And so we know it's fire implies oxygen, not oxygen implies fire. So the implication now is going this way. So this fire and oxygen seems to be a good one that seems to help it click in students' heads. Well, that only, that only works because you have to have, you have, to have oxygen and have fire. You this implication, so if I would have swapped it, then the implication would have been false. Yeah. But which way it's saying it's happening is this way. We're saying this implies this. If I swap oxygen and fire, now it's a false implication. Oh. But we're still saying the implication is this implies this. I'm still yes. claiming if I write alpha only if beta, I'm claiming alpha implies beta. Okay. Maybe it's true, maybe it's false. I just gave you an example where they're both true to help your intuition. No, okay, I think it's yeah. Okay, so up here, we're claiming beta implies alpha. Down here, we're claiming alpha implies beta. If we call the left-hand term alpha in both cases and the right-hand term beta in both cases. I didn't read the only in the it will rain. Oh. <laughs> okay. So good? Yeah. So only if is the same thing as implies. You can always replace only if with implies and you're good. There is fire implies there is oxygen. Okay. So it will rain tomorrow only if it's cold. If cold is 
All the F can be replaced with implies. And it says the exact same thing. Oh, all right. But if I, I could reword that as saying... It will, it will rain, rain tomorrow, tomorrow implies it gets cold. It sounds a little bit funny in English. We have to clean up the English a little bit because it's not just a direct translation, but... It will rain tomorrow implies it got cold. Okay, so does that mean I can say it will rain tomorrow, but if it rains tomorrow, then it will get cold? If it rains tomorrow, then it got cold. Would be correcting the grammar a little bit, but it yes. Got cold. So, yeah, that grammar. That's just because just you have to correct the grammar a little bit because of English. English. So that's a consequence of English, not a consequence of logic. Okay. Because we need to switch our gets for our got. But they're saying, they're communicating the same idea, right? Yeah. It's just about tense. So, you have to adjust it for English a little bit. Remember that logic predates English. Excuse me. Maybe I just don't understand what if, only if means. <laughs> well, here's exactly what it means. It means that that implies that. But the bottom one makes perfect sense. Uh, the third one up from the bottom is my good where I, it just doesn't trick Except for good Oh, you just need to learn Latin and Greek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be probably just a slow <laughs> Alright. So only if says the exact same thing as implies. You can always replace an only if with implies and it says the same thing. And it's going to be good for you in your head to think only if is implies, only if is implies. Because that one will trip you up over and over again. It's an easy one to get caught up. Did I push next? No. no. That's still the same. Okay. Alright. Put the following in a beta if alpha form. No, we don't need to do that. It's telling you to put it in a different form just to help make sure you got it, but I don't want to focus too much on implications. We can do these ones. These are good to help make sure you're getting it. Okay, what can you conclude given the following statements? So first we're gonna start with, we're taking this for granted. If Brad is on the team, he must go to bed early. Let's assume that's true. All right, what can you conclude if I tell you if Brad goes to bed early? Now, maybe he didn't make the team and he's depressed. He went to bed early. Okay. He's sad about it, right? Yeah. What if I tell you Fred does not go to bed early? He did not go on the team. Then he's for sure not on the team. Okay. Because if he was on the team, he'd have to go to bed early. Yes. Good. Let's try again. Next one. If a man is a postman, he has foot trouble. Okay? We're assuming that's true. Now I tell you, this man has perfect feet. He's not, he's not a postman. postman. He's not a postman. I tell you, that man has foot trouble. He could, be a, he could be a postman. He could be a postman, but maybe not. Maybe he's a football player. <laughs> yeah, maybe he was just amputated. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a pretty big foot problem. Can you have a, can you have a foot problem if you don't have a foot? <laughs> if you're missing a foot, I think you've got the worst foot problem of all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You will be given a ticket only if you are a sophomore. <laughs> Gene was given a ticket. They are a sophomore. He is a sophomore. Then Gene must be a sophomore, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. No, you all missed it. <laughs> You're so <laughs> kidding me. <laughs> no, you got right. I just wanted to see if anyone would say, no, I got right. Yes. This is saying, you get a ticket implies you're a sophomore. So if you got a ticket, you're for sure a sophomore. Okay. I tell you, George is a sophomore. He could have gotten a ticket. No, he got one for sure. No. Because you are given a ticket only if you're a sophomore. You are a sophomore no. and you're given a ticket? Is that the way of saying that? Yeah, it's technically. It's the same thing, right? Like, well, mm. A only if. <laughs> that, no, I got you guys confused. <laughs> you can only this have... one, Jean was given a ticket. If Jean was given a ticket, then we know she's a sophomore. Uh -huh. If George is a sophomore, we do not know he was given a ticket. Maybe he was, maybe they wasn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't have enough tickets to give all the sophomores a ticket. Mm -hmm. So only the people who got tickets were sophomores. So it's true that uh, she got a ticket. It's true that you'll be given a ticket only if you're a sophomore, but it doesn't mean every sophomore got a ticket. Yeah, right. It just because means everyone who got a ticket was a sophomore. What you're saying is that you will be given a ticket implies you're a sophomore is what we should do. Perfect. Be you'll be given a ticket implies you're a sophomore. Ah. Yep. I'm telling you, replacing that only if with implies <laughs> yeah. will save your soul. Okay. Let's try the next one. The house will burn down if we don't get water. Let's say we did get some water. Could have still burned down. I could have brought you a nice glass of water. So there you go, <laughs> save the house. No. What do we know if we didn't get some water? The house for sure burned down. 
Okay, I think we're getting a feel for these. How to reason about these knots. <laughs> okay, now I'm writing the truth table for these. You're going to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you that right now. So let's come up with the truth table for implies. And I'll go through all the explanation if I need to. Maybe you'll just get we don't need the explanation. We'll see. Alpha implies beta. Okay. Let's just try appealing to you your language first. So we set the case. Holding a truck, holding an eraser. If I'm holding a truck, then I'm holding an eraser. True or false? False. False. All right. We're in trouble. <laughs> if I'm holding one, what is false? So... And that's not even through the rough one first, but let's go over this. Now, when we say if then or implies, we'll typically phrase it as an if then. That's typically the way I'll word it. Now, if then is not the same thing as if it was the case in this universe that blah, 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 then it would be the case in this universe that blah, blah, blah. You're going to want to interpret if then as setting up some hypothetical, some scientific hypothetical scenario in our universe. And that is not what it's saying. Huh? It could be anything. It's just if then. Mm -hmm. So don't think that you get to mess with things in our universe to try and set up some, some scenario. It's just saying if alpha, then beta. So let me give you two examples. One, if there are 100 husbands in America, then there is only one wife. Is that true or false? Okay. You're going to hate me, but it's true. <laughs> How do I know it's true? We call this what we call vacuously true, but here's one intuition for me. You say that it's false. I say, how do you know it's false? Are there 100 husbands in America? And by this I mean exactly. There are a lot. Now, so how do you know that if this is false, or how do you know that this implication is false? How do you know that if there are 100 husbands in America, then there's only one wife? Okay, I see it. Now, you'll be tempted to think that in our universe, if it was the case that there was only 100 husbands in America, then it would be the case that there would only be one wife. That's a different question, allowing you to change the current state of the statement you're working with. We have to think about these as static, not part of this universe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Unchanging, there's no time, there's no physics, we're in something much more fun fundamental than physics. Yeah. We're in logic. And so you have to take the statements as they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we call a statement vacuously true if the antecedent is false. If the antecedent is false, the statement is vacuously true. So if there are 100 husbands in America, then there's only one wife is a true statement. Okay. Because the antecedent is false. I see. So we call it vacuously true. Here's another one. If one equals zero, then I'm the Pope. That's a true statement. Yeah. Okay. Now sometimes our vacuously true statements, you can actually directly prove them to give you some of the feel goods. So I'm actually going to prove this to you and make you feel good about this one. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay, let's assume for a second that 1 is equal to 0. You with me so far? Yeah. I'm going to add 1 to both sides. So then 2 is equal to 1, right? Yeah. If 1 is equal to 0, then 2 is equal to 1. Just add 1 to both sides. Right. Okay. Yeah. We good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the Pope and I are 2. And since 2 is equal to 1, then the Pope and I are 1. Therefore, I'm the Pope. I <laughs> <laughs> If 1 is equal to 0, then 2 is equal to 1. Yeah, right? Yes. One and if the Pope and I are 2, then the Pope and I are 1. Because 2 is equal to 1. They're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm the Pope. Okay. <laughs> and so there's a direct proof of one of these vacuously true statements. So sometimes I can give you the feel goods about it and we can prove it directly. But in general, if your antecedent is false, your implication is true. Could you write out the fundamental logic? The truth table? No, the, the more fundamental logic of uh, written out and then or and then not the case. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. That's not more fundamental, but I know what you want. You want not alpha or beta. Yeah, that's it's logically the equivalent. Statement. That's the only thing I understand about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the only possible way I can comprehend it. <laughs> Say the same thing. All right. So, vacuously true. An implication is vacuously true, provided the antecedent cannot be satisfied. Mm -hmm. I can say, if Donnie's a purple dragon, then, and it doesn't matter how I finish it, it's always true. Yeah. If Donnie's a purple dragon, then, there's a 10-foot spider on the building. That's true. If Donnie's a purple dragon, then, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. It's vacuously true. Okay. 
So now let's train and fill out the truth table. Okay. okay. If Donnie's holding a piece of chalk, then Donnie's holding an eraser. True. Now this is, you think about this statically. You don't think about, well, potentially I could drop one or the other. No, this is the whole universe. Me like this. There's no time, there's no space, there's no nothing. There's just this mm -hmm. and nothing else. Okay, so in this case, it's true. For Bertha, I'm not holding a chalker, I'm holding an eraser. True. True. All right, next one. If I'm holding a chalk, then I'm holding an eraser. False. 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 For Bertha, <laughs> I'm not holding chalk or I'm holding an eraser. False. False. They're logically equivalent. Spoiler. <laughs> I didn't lie to them. Okay. Next one. If I'm holding a chalk, then I'm holding an eraser. False. False. Oh, sorry. True. How do you know it's false? If I'm holding a chalk, then I'm holding an eraser. Is it false? Can you call that false? No. You can't. Not in this you can't call it false. And if it's not false, what is it? True. true. Not false is true. Yeah, but can you say flip it? If you can't say it's true, then you can't say it's then you can't say it's false. It's not true. It's, false. it's a statement, so it's either true or false. And if it's not false, what is it? True. True. But Agreed. it's not true. Well, it's false. this is just to help your intuition. You're not comfortable calling it true. So I ask you instead, is it false? You say no. It's just to help your intuition. It's a trick to help your intuition. It has nothing to do with it's not what, the, what the reality <laughs> is, I guess. <laughs> so sometimes a helpful trick to asking your head is, is it false? If you say, is it false? Well, no. Then it's true. Not false, is true. So, true. And finally, if I'm holding a chalk, then I'm holding an eraser. True. You can't call it false, so it's not false, so it's true. Or, either I'm not holding a chalk, or I'm holding an eraser. True. Yeah. true. So, true, true. I'll leave this one, but that one's true. <coughs> that one is, I'm not holding a chalk, or I'm holding an eraser. So the only one that's false is true and false? Yeah, there's only one case to show an implication is false. And that's to show that the antecedent is true and the conclusion is false. That's the only way for it to be false. Because I'm saying alpha implies beta. If you're saying that's not the case, then you're saying it's possible for alpha to be true and beta to be false. Right, that's how you would disprove it. Okay. So I'm saying someone claims alpha implies beta. And you say, no, that's not the case. How do you prove them false? You show that there's a time where their antecedent is true, but their conclusion is false. Right. Okay. I say, if I'm wearing socks, then I'm wearing shoes. How would you prove me wrong? Find a time where I'm wearing socks and not wearing shoes. Find a time where you can satisfy the antecedent and get the conclusion is false. Mm -hmm. That's how you disprove it. So that's the only time an implication is false. Think about how you could disprove it. Mm -hmm. That's when it's false. If that helps. <laughs> All right, we won't spend time on the converse or the contrapositive. Yeah, sorry. We'll introduce them if they come up in class and end up being useful. Got to keep moving because got to get the predicates and identity. So finally, the last operator that we're going to talk about is logical equivalence. So the if and only if. So when I say alpha if beta, we know that's the same thing as beta implies alpha. And that alpha only if beta is the same thing as alpha implies beta. Remember, you can replace only if with an implies. Mm -hmm. So then, if I tell you alpha if and only if beta, then alpha if beta means beta implies alpha, and alpha only if beta means alpha implies beta. So when I say alpha if and only if beta, I'm saying alpha implies beta and beta implies alpha. We're saying both those things are true. Since alpha if and only if beta is used so frequently, we have a shorthand way of saying it. And we say alpha if with two f's beta. That means alpha implies beta and beta implies alpha. And that's what we mean by they're logically equivalent. So logical equivalence, we call two statements alpha and beta logically equivalent, provided that alpha if and only if beta. We also call alpha if and only if beta a biconditional, because it's two conditional statements and it together, a biconditional, or an equivalence. I'll typically call them an equivalence. Notation, we write alpha if and only if beta as this double arrow, double arrow back and forth. Yep. And we won't bother with the truth table for it. 
But if alpha and beta are the same, it comes out true. If alpha and beta are different, it comes out false. So we have our five basic operators for propositional logic. We have not, and, or, implies, and if and only if for equivalence. And this is the precedence that these things take. You can kind of guess from context what the precedence is, but I mean the order that you apply them. This acts a lot like a negative sign in math. You always apply the negative sign to the number first. When I talk about negative three, you apply the negative sign first. This acts a lot like a multiplies. This acts a lot like an add. Don't really have a good one for this anymore. And then this acts a lot like an equals. So this is the order of precedence. Anymore? What are these to do? That, did I say anymore? You, say, yeah, anymore. You, don't, you said I don't have a good one for this anymore. Oh, I'm saying you can think about this as a negative. You can think about this as a times. You can think about this as a plus. You can think about this as an equals. And I don't have a good example oh. for how you oh, think. Okay. I ran out of good examples. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. But just to give you an idea. So if I say alpha implies beta is logically equivalent to not beta implies not alpha. And now we put in all the parentheses. Here's exactly what we're saying. We were saying alpha implies beta is logically equivalent to not beta implies not alpha. That's true. Right? Yeah. That, this is true, so that's contrapositive. But just saying how you would read that if I didn't bother putting in any of the parentheses. So it's just telling you how to apply the logical operators. And for those of you who do programming, it's the same as programming, with the not the end in the or. So alpha or beta and not alpha is the same thing as alpha or beta and not alpha. So you do your nots first, then your ands, then your ors, then your implies, then your equivalences. Okay. So there's our five symbols for uh, propositional logic. Uh, two more words. I think I've already introduced them, but introduce yeah. them again. Tautology. What's a tautology? It's a statement that's always true. Okay. Here's an example of a tautology. Alpha or not alpha. Mm -hmm. Concrete example. The sky's blue or the sky's not blue. True. That's always true. Because if the sky is blue, it's true. But if the sky's not blue, then it's true that the sky's not blue. Mm -hmm. So this is true or this is true. Remember, alpha has to be true or not alpha has to be true. Mm -hmm. If alpha is true, not alpha is false. If alpha is false, then not alpha is true. So one of these is always true. Mm -hmm. okay. And true in an or always makes it true. Another example. Your teacher gives you a problem and they say solve for x. And you answer, x is equal to 6 or x is not equal to 6. <laughs> that's true. That's right. X is either 6 or not 6. You got it. It's a tautology, always true, regardless of what x is. I should try that. Good? Yeah. Okay, now we have a contradiction. Contradiction is a statement that's always false. Alpha and not alpha, those are contradictions. Or there's a contradiction. The sky's blue and the sky's not blue. No, that's impossible, it's always false. Worst answer you can get. It's six and not six, teacher. No. Yeah. Okay. So with that, we're able now to step into Oh, this is just a quick review. So, a quick review. So far, we've been talking about statements. Just want to tell you, proposition is something that's either true or false, but not both. Not necessarily a sentence. Now, every statement is a proposition. Not every proposition is a statement. So, that's why it's called propositional logic. Although, we're mostly just going to talk about statements, a particular type of proposition. And we got our common operators. We proved a couple theorems along the way. The way that you prove these is just with the truth table. So, we only proved one of them, but we could have proved all of them. Do it with the truth table. Okay, and then remember all the way back to when uh, we came across this x plus 2 equal to 5, we said that that was not a statement. This was not a proposition. Yeah. Right? Clear back at the beginning. And I told you we'd come back to that. Because it depends upon x to determine if it's true or false. But once I know the x, I can then call this true or false. So that is what we call a predicate. Uh, by the way, you forgot your h makes it both. I won. Oh, not Bob. Yeah. I'm sure I'll forget that. <laughs> that will probably correct me again next time I do this. Okay, so now we move on to predicate logic. So we've done propositional logic. Predicate logic will be a bit quicker. A lot quicker. Predicate logic. What's a predicate? A predicate, for those of you who like the dense verbiage, a predicate is a proposition valued function of some number of variables. Maybe one, maybe more. In particular, a predicate of two variables is called a relation. Now, for those of you who don't want the dense language, what's a predicate? It's something that you give me a term and I spit out true or false. So I'm going to give you an example. There's the is brown predicate. Is brown. You give me something and I spit out true or false. 
You give me the desk, I spit out true. You give me my shirt, I spit out false. So it eats up a term and spits out true or false. It eats up one term, maybe two terms, maybe three terms. So is brown is a predicate. This is the is brown predicate. X is brown. True or false depends on the X. Here's another one, X likes Y. This is a two-term predicate. It takes two terms to determine if it's true or false. Two-term predicates we have a special name for. We call them relations. X likes Y. If you hand me Jack and Jill, this spits out true. If you hand me Jack and Bob, it spits out false. Those guys have been fighting like crazy lately, right? Mm -hmm. This is a is greater than two predicate. If you give me 19, I spit out true. If you give me negative seven, I spit out false. One term predicate. And you can have word predicates. We can have that is Bob's best friend predicate. If you hand me Jerry, it spits out true. If you hand me Frank, it spits out false. Okay, right, bunch of different predicates. Some more useful than others, but you can create any predicate that you want. All it has to do is eat up a term and spit out true or false, spit out a proposition. Okay, notation. Uh, this is just for the sake of your math. So notation, for a single variable predicate, we often write it as P of X, where P stands for a predicate. And for a relation, we may write Q, remember that's one that takes two terms, Q of X and Y. Specifically for relations, it is common to write the name of the relation between them. So rather than writing Q of X and Y, then you write XQY. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like infix notation for you programmers. Example, this is perfectly valid notation. The less than relation applies to one and two. We never write it like that. We instead write one is less than two like this. The less than relation is a relation. It takes two terms and it spits out true or false. So it's a predicate, a, spe a specific type of predicate called a relation. It takes two terms, spits out false. These special ones, we can write their name in the middle rather than passing the terms in like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So which of the following is a predicate? X is blue. Yeah, no. Yes, that's a predicate. Jack is taller than Jill. No, no. no that's a proposition. Y is greater than two. Yes. Two plus two equals four. No. That's a proposition. X loves Y. Yes. yes. Go home. No. no, that's a proposition. That's not a proposition. No, it's not even a proposition. It's just words. We don't care about those types of collections of words and logic. <laughs> Whatever it's called. Who cares? Not a proposition. Get rid of it. X is greater than or equal to two. Yes. Yes, predicate. X, Y, and Z are triplets. Yes. Yeah. It's a three-term predicate. Okay. You gotta give me three terms, but if you give me those three terms, I can answer yes or no, true or false. Okay. okay. Jack is taller than X. Yes. Yeah, that's the Jack is taller than predicate. X is blue and Y is greater than two. Yes. Yeah. What that mean? Give me X and Y and I can tell you whether it's true or false. Would that be uh, okay. like a relation or two predicates? That's a relation. It's a weird relation. Mm -hmm. It's that is blue and the other is greater than two relation, and we don't have a good way to say it because it's a dumb relation, but it's a fun, it's a relation we can use. So for that statement to be true, would it have to be like if X is the ball and it's a blue ball, and Y is three. Yeah, if you give me ball, a blue ball and three, then this will spell out true. Okay, but what if Y was one? So if you gave me a blue ball and you gave me one, then this spits out false because that's true and that's false, and true and false is false. Is there a um, a sentence that's a predicate that does not contain a variable. Uh, so I write these predicates with variables, but I could have called this just the uh, the is blue predicate. Typically, you use the variable as a placeholder to tell you where the term goes. Oh, that oh I get that. Sense. So I could have just called it the is blue predicate. Gotcha. So the x is not the predicate; it's the is blue. Yeah. Yeah. This is the is blue predicate. The variable is a placeholder to tell you where the variable goes. That would be a lot harder to guess if you remove those. <laughs> so this is the less than relation. And we don't need to write x less than y. You already knew that the terms went there. Yeah. So sometimes it's clear where the terms go. Sometimes not as much. If you stick the variables in, it's just saying, here's where you would stick the terms. Can you take all of those, like Jack is taller than Joe, can you change that symbol for greater than? Or is taller than, can you change that for greater than? On the top. Jack. Sure. Could it, I'm saying, could all these sentences be reduced to like symbols? Oh, no, not necessarily. Okay. What's the symbol for loves? Yeah. 
Yeah, so no, not all these things are well-defined or things that we can reduce to notation that we know and love. A term like Jack is taller than Jill. Uh, Jack and Jill are like constants in that case. Yep. Yeah. Yep, so that's a particular, that's a particular, so this is just a proposition. When you take a predicate and you set it and you, and you plug in all the variables, you're left with a proposition. Take the predicate, plug in the variables, you have a proposition. That's how you convert a predicate to a proposition. You can give it the terms or replace the variables with constants. All right, predicate. No, uh, we don't, we not, no, we don't need to think about how we combine predicates to make new predicates. So moving on to our quantifiers. The universal quantifier. So we have two quantifiers that we use all the time. The universal quantifier, that upside down A, I will use this all the time. Typically read as for all, for each, or for every. And then we have our existential quantifier, this backwards E, typically read as there exists. So I'm going to read these now. For all x, x is greater than 2. That's how I would read that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read that. There exists x, x greater than 2. Sounds weird. When we read a there exists, when we go from in between the parentheses in English, this is consequence of English, we always say such that. There exists an x such that x is greater than 2. Mm -hmm. So if you want the English to come out good, anytime after you read an existential quantifier, say such that. So this says for all x, x is greater than 2. This says there exists an x such that x is greater than 2. And that's the way you would read those. Notice that while the predicate x is greater than 2 is not a proposition, so x is greater than 2, is that a proposition? No. No, it's a predicate. But now, what about this? Yes. Read this. For all x, x is greater than 2. Yes. That is now a proposition. That's not something you can call true or false. Yep. So one way to convert a predicate to a proposition is to plug in the term and get rid of the variable. Another way we can do it is to add a quantifier. Yep. So for all x, x is greater than 2, yep, that's a proposition. That was a predicate. When we add the quantifier, we now have a proposition. Similarly, I could add in an existential quantifier does the same thing. There exists an x such that x is greater than 2. True or false? True. True. Since you can call it true or false, since you can classify it, then it's now a proposition. So two ways to convert predicates to proposition. Either one, replace all your variables with constants, or two, add a quantifier for every variable in your predicate. Both of those will convert a predicate to a proposition. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's get comfortable with these things because quantifiers are one of those things that never go away again. So those five symbols that came up, in particularly the or, the and, the not, and the applies, they'll come up all the time. And then these two symbols for all and there exists will come up a lot. So I want you to get comfortable with them. So I'm going to write some statements here. X plus Y equals zero. Statements. They better be statements when it's all signed up. So far, it's just a predicate, like you just said, right? I'm going to write uh, for all x, for all y. Sorry about that, writing small. I'll move to the left more, but hopefully you know what that says. It's going to be for all x, there exists y. If we're applying it to the whole thing, you can put square brackets here to help make it clear. This one, I'm going to put there exists x for all y. Square bracket, square bracket, and then finally there exists there exists. And now we're going to read each of these and you're going to tell me true or false. For all x and for all y, x plus y is equal to zero. False. For any two x and y, x plus y equals zero. False. This is false. For all x and for all y, x plus y is equal to zero. Oh. False. Yeah. But it is a pre or it is a proposition. I thought that's what we were asking. Okay, yeah. No. Not is it a proposition. So it turns out all these are going to be propositions. Since I had two variables, adding two quantifiers turns it into a proposition. Yeah. So all these we should be able to say true or false. Now, for all x, there exists a y such that, remember, always say such that after your existential quantifier. For all x, there exists a y such that x plus y is equal to zero. Yes, that's true. Yes. That's true. For any x you choose, I can always find a y such that their sum is zero. Yeah. Okay. True. All right. There exists an x such that for all y, x plus y equals zero. True. Yep. No. False. There is no magic x you can find such that no matter what I add to it, we get zero. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this one's false. 
So notice our order of our quantifiers matter. Yes. For all there exists is not the same thing as there exists for all. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, and then finally, there exists an x and there exists a y such that x plus y is equal to zero. True. True. We can find two terms that make that true. Yes. All right. And then just to help make this concrete, I'm going to replace all my pluses with times and do it again. Times, 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 times. For all x and for all y, x times y equals zero? False. Okay. For all x, there exists a y such that x times y equals zero? True. True. There exists an x such that for all y, x times y equals zero? False. True. Oh, it's zero. The magic x is zero. zero. There exists an x, namely zero. Such that for all y, x times y equals zero. I gotta think about this. Dang it. So, okay. And then there exists an x, and there exists a y such that x times y equals zero. True. Sure. So notice that we didn't get the same thing as before. So it does depend on what's actually written in here. Yeah. Okay. So order matters, and what you actually have written in here, they both matter. Okay. And I think you're getting comfortable reading these, which is good. Well, comfortable with me reading them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will not talk about negating these quantifiers. Maybe I'll tell you it once. For all x, p, some predicate about x, if we want to negate that, if we want to negate a for all, maybe go back to the previous slide and we'll skip this one because I had a word example. So we'll do one example with it. So forget that, forget that. This one. So let p of x be any predicate. Then there exists an x such that p of x says the exact same thing as it is not the case that for all x, not p of x. That's true. So these are logically equivalent. Yes. And so this tells you how to distribute a not over an and uh, for all. If I have not for all not, take the not inside and swatch, swap your for all for there exists. And so if I negate this, so seeing that these two say the same things, there exists a swan such that it is black. So P is the is black predicate. Mm -hmm. X, we're plugging in swans. So there exists a swan such that it is black. Says the exact same thing as it is not the case, the not. It is not the case that for every swan, it is not black. There exists a black swan says the same thing as it is not the case that every swan is not black. There exists a black swan. It is not the case that all swans are not black. Those say the same thing. Now, technically speaking, just for the sake of completeness, take you quickly through this. I told you that for all x, p of x is a proposition. So this is true if and only if p of x is true independent of x. Mm. Otherwise, we say it's false. And then here's our actual definition for our existential quantifier. If that's a bit dense for you, that's fine. Oh. Just point that out for a second. Completeness. So you actually define that there exists in terms of a for all, but really? not crucial for this class. Yes. Or you could have gone the other way. But that's the more natural way. Okay. Unfortunately, we won't do that. That's an example of that. Get to the law of identity and then we'll call. Okay. So we did propositional logic, we did predicate logic. Now, logic with identity. Introduce identity into the system. So all we do to introduce identity into our logic is we introduce what's called the law of identity. What is the law of identity? It's these two things packaged together. Unfortunately, what's colloquially called the law of identity is this piece, and then this is sometimes called the principle of existentiality. But together, they're called the principle of identity or the law of identity and logic. It's both these things. So now, explain the two pieces to you. What's typically called the law of identity it says everything is identical with itself. Or it's often stated as A is A. But using our more precise notation, what it says is that for all x, x equals x. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. All right. And then the principle of ex extensionality says that equals may be substituted for equals. If I know that x is equal to a, and I know that x is equal to y, I can replace that x with an a, and this is now true. Mm -hmm. 
So if I know this and I know this, I can use those to conclude that A is equal to Y. I'm not substituting an equal with an equal. Good? Yeah. All right. We're going to prove, really quick, three theorems of logic now that you use all the time in mathematics. These are not theorems of mathematics. These are not things you prove in mathematics. These are not axioms of mathematics. They're more foundational than that. These are theorems of logic. Here's what we're going to prove. I'm going to prove if A equals B, then A plus C is equal to B plus C. And this has nothing to do with arithmetic, and it's being true. Mm -hmm. yeah. You ready for the proof? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So I know that everything, I'm going to use this principle, everything is identical with itself. So C equals C. So I know, first off, I know that A equals B. I know that's true. That's given. So I'm showing if A equals B, then A plus C equals B plus C. Mm -hmm. So this is what's given. Now I'm going to use the law of identity here. The law of identity says everything is identical with itself. So I know that A plus C is equal to A plus C. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what that plus is. It doesn't matter what that C is. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. This is always the case because the law of identity has nothing to do with math. More foundational than that. Mm -hmm. This is logic. So this is using the law of identity. This is what was given. Now equals may be substitute for equals. I'm going to use the principle of extensionality. So I can replace this A with a B. Mm -hmm. So now... Putting those two together, I now know that A plus C is equal to B plus C. Yep. There's our proof. Notice that we have to use both these principles of logic to do it. Are they... You can't prove those, can you? Uh, prove, uh, prove these laws? Yeah. No. Are they... I don't want to say are axioms, but are they axioms? No. They're more foundational than axioms. So what are they? They are the rules that identity must abide by. And so if you use identity, it has to follow these two rules. Definition? Or part of the definition? Part of the definition? No, you're trying to fit them in an axiomatic system. You have to use these notions to construct your axiomatic systems. There's foundational notions that you can't get away from. And so often the way that we validate some of these things to ourselves, it, it's just a psychological trick, but oftentimes we call it affirmation by denial. What? Yeah, so here's a simple one that's easy to follow. So how do I prove that it's impossible to have both alpha and not alpha? This is often called the law of contradiction. We say this is always false. Law of contradiction is always false. Let's say you had a person who came along and he says, I don't agree with the law of contradiction. Okay? They say, I don't think that the law of contradiction is true. I say, wonderful, I'm so glad that you accept the law of contradiction. They say, no, no, no. I'm saying that it's false. I'm saying, fantastic, I'm glad that you think it's true. You say, no, no, no. I'm saying that it's true, not false. And it can't be both. No. Law of contradiction. If it's true, then it's not false. If it's false, it's not true. Mm -hmm. So they have to use it to try and argue against it. So these are the fundamental concepts that you have to use them if you're going to be rigorous talking about things. Okay. And so it's the rules that identity has to abide by if identity is going to mean anything. So you want to use this concept of identity? Here's what you're using. It's good. It's a good question. More foundational than any axiomatic system. Right. Now we can prove this the exact same way. If A is equal to B, then A times C is equal to B times C. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same proof. Let's assume A is equal to B. Uh, law of identity tells me A times C is equal to B times C. Now I use principle of extensionality to say that A times C, oops, A, A, and now I can replace A with a B, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now forget about times. Anything. Put anything there, as long as what we're talking about is defined. Then it works. For any operation, as long as these things are well defined, what's all said and done, so you're not breaking anything, then this is always and forever the case. And it's more foundational than any field of math. And so that's why every field of math uses this logic. And it's never endowed in the axioms anymore. I stress that because I was very confused by that for a long time, and no professor ever taught me that. <laughs> well, isn't that it's very the same frustrating. thing as proving you're, you're the Pope using the same logic? I uh, know. Using I'm the Pope, I was actually using some arithmetic. Yeah. But right. two and one are just variables. Like. No, those are constants, those are numbers. And I said, if zero is equal to one, add one to both sides. And so I was assuming you knew how to add one to both sides. Oh. That was just meant to be a feel-good example. That wasn't anything rigorous. Well, it feels like it fits into that. Yeah, those two 
But no, what we did here is completely rigorous. Mm -hmm. We made reference to our rule of logic that we used every step of the way. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it's different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that concludes our crash course on logic. That will give us the foundations that we need to start doing an analysis on philosophy. That's it. This class is going to get much, much, much easier from here on out. This is the dense as it gets. And we won't get this dense again until Aristotle. And then we'll just be repeating some of the same stuff. <laughs> So we will recover some of this as Aristotle is the first one who discovers logic. So next, <laughs> yeah. How do you be a philosopher if you don't know logic? The same way we've considered <laughs> logical our entire There lives. are modern philosophers who, honest to goodness, think that you can't use logic. And think that contradictions exist in this world, left and right. And so logic, forget logic, doesn't work. And yes, honest to goodness, these are real people who sincerely believe these things. And they make a Heraclitian argument. Well, I'll talk more about that when we get to Heraclitus. But yes, a lot of these asinine views that people have, you can go isolate where they came from in the past, and you can say, that's why that's wrong, that's why that's wrong, that's why that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of what I'll try to do in this class. I'll try to first get you confused like they were confused. I'll try to get you to believe their argument. And I'll show you how silly that was. <laughs> that's the goal. We'll see how successful I am. But yeah, so next class we'll be starting more philosophy proper. This was to give you a found, an analytical foundation so that you can do an analysis of arguments. The next thing I'm going to do next class, which will probably take like an hour, is give you then a historical context. So I'm going to try and do a crash course on world history really quick. All of it? Kind of, just for the West. But it will be like a crash, crash course. Like we'll say there was Egypt, then there was Assyria, then there was Babylonians, and then here comes the Persians, and Greece and Persia are about to go to war. Um, okay. <laughs> It'll be like that fast. Okay. Not really. We'll drag it out some fun. Gives you an idea. Important. What we're going to be focusing on now, for you to get comfortable just with what we're talking about, is geography around the Mediterranean Sea. If you're not comfortable with the Mediterranean Sea, if you don't have a picture in your head what I'm saying when I say that, it'll be very useful if you go look at Greece on a map for a bit. Uh, show you exactly what map I'll be talking about over and over again. So, we will be looking at maps like this over and over again. So, here we are Spain, Africa's down here, Egypt's over here, here's the Italian Peninsula, Sicily, here's Greece, Lydia, or Asia Minor. We're going to call it Lydia Rock, Lock, and then the east over here is the Middle East. Israel, modern day Israel is right here. Is your map list? A little bit. Is it? It's, it's tilted. Well, you just said. This is west, this is east. Yeah. Wow. Well, how was Egypt like way down there? Egypt's down in Africa. Let's zoom out, look at the whole world, and make it very clear where we're talking about. So, Egypt, right here, on where's, the Nile. Where's Spain? Spain? I think so. Oh. Spain, England. Yeah, it looks like it's tilted. Greece. France. Germany. Sorry. Oh. Egypt. Russia. Okay. It just looked like Africa was the Mediterranean. Well, it looked like the Mediterranean was Africa, and then Africa okay. was the sea. I mean, the <laughs> colors might have been weird because of the blue. But yeah. yeah. So we're looking around the Mediterranean Sea here. You need to be comfortable around the Mediterranean Sea and around the Black Sea with the geography here. Mm -hmm. We're going to be focusing in on this part of the world and doing a crash course on the history going on in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. That's the important part. You can forget about everything over here. You can forget about pretty much everything below Egypt. And you can forget about here we got to go kind of far to the right as far as Persia goes, but you can forget about the rest. How and far north? Yeah, forget about it. How far forward in history are you in? As far as we get. Well, like three crash course. Oh, the first one? The first one, I'm going to be trying to set the scene for Thales. So Thales, exit, he's coming right before the Grecian persian Wars start. Mm -hmm. So Thales exists right as Persia, he's dying right as Persia conquers Lydia. This is Lydia right here. Is it super important to know the historical context? Uh, it, it's very helpful for two reasons. 
One, a lot of what we're doing is history, and it just helps you keep track of who's who, where they are, and what's going on. So you're not just feel like you're giving all these long names, but you couldn't place them anywhere. anywhere. Okay. So it's useful that way. The second way it's useful is a lot of what they're doing, what they're talking about, what the philosophers are talking about, it's often a response to what is currently going on in the world. Right. So knowing what's going on in the world helps you uh, classify people. Because a as a general rule, a common thing that happens as, as a civilization flourishes, it's people class into skepticism. And so that's a common trend that you can identify. And so you can often get skeptics coming after some sort of civilization peak. The civilization kind of peaks, skepticism, and then usually goes on a downward turn. Mm -hmm. That's a skepticism. Nothing can be known. It's just your opinion. Um, who's to say what's good, what's evil? It's just a matter of your preferences. There's no true good, it's no true right. evil. There's no true beauty. There's no true are ugly. We, we There's right? no, that's just your right, truth. Right? That's not the truth. That's just your truth. It's your truth and my truth. And nothing can really be known. So it's a common trend, just to pick one trend in history. It's a common trend that a civilization goes on a rise, and then as it goes on a rise, its people collapse into skepticism and uh, immorality relative to what their moral standards were in the past. So they reject their past moral standards and collapse into skepticism. And that usually leads to a collapse in civilization, and then a cycle back up, and a collapse, cycle back so, up, and collapse. It's a common trend in history. Is that civilization is not a collapse? Source of, uh, collapse of civilization. I'm not saying one so, is a source of the other. I'm saying it's a common trend in history. That's all I'm saying. You believe <laughs> I believe that a common trend, there's a relation going on between them. Yes, I think the fact that we had Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all in a row, three people who unquestionably believed in the absolute and objective truth, absolute and objective good, absolute and objective beauty, yeah. set philosophy on this huge rampage that we, won't re we will not see anyone reaching the heights of Aristotle for well over a thousand years. And all three of them just built on each other, each one taking what the previous person did and just working with it. Yeah. It's amazing. And so to get three thinkers like that all in a row who are all great thinkers, it just doesn't happen. It's amazing. And so, yeah, we'll see how Aristotle kicks off. I mean, we drew our little pyramid here, talking about how he's the one who showed out language is at the foundation of logic, logic is at the foundation of science. Everything Aristotle did, it's, it's amazing. Aristotle, he's a one in a, I don't know, how many people have there been? <laughs> uh, <laughs> one in that many person. If I were to classify, like, the three greatest uh, intellectual contributors to Western civilization, I'd be hard-pressed to choose between Aristotle, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein. Those three are in a tier of their own, and then there's the rest. And we can argue about the rest, but those three are those three. It's amazing. Are you, are you saying that uh, throughout this course you're going to be able to define exactly what good and evil is? Well, <laughs> we are going to be talking about philosophers and their perspectives. And so you're getting those in Greece that uh, after the Grecian Persian Wars, we're going to see the rise of sophists and sophistry. It even has a negative connotation today. That's pure sophistry. And they're going to be pretty much the skeptics. We'll get to Gorgas, who said, you can't know anything. Even if you could, you couldn't communicate it. Even if you can't communicate it, what am I missing? Ah, there's three of them. I missed a piece. We'll get to it. Yeah. We'll cover everything. Don't know how far we're going to go. We're going to go as far as we can go. Pretty much until you guys get bored, probably. Is the <laughs> philosopher's uh, sitting in the barrel? Oh, di Diogenes? <clears throat> Diogenes? The cynic. Yeah. Oh, he's a cynic, not a skeptic. So. Yeah. He's a cynic. He was a... Well, we'll get to him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need to explain all today. Okay. Any other big picture questions about where this is going? You got... Everything's going to be happening around here. We're going to do a crash course on the history around here. Good to be familiar with the geography, at least. Yeah, where does philosophy kind of start? Philosophy starts with Thales of Miletus, right there. No, that Egypt's down here. This is up in uh, the coast of Lydia. Turkey. Turkey. Yeah. What did you say the history was going on during this time? Pretty fine. At the end of his death, so Persia is on the rise during his time. So, 
Um, how am I spacing on his name? Persian prince. Cyrus. The Median prince. He takes over the Medes, creates the Persian Empire, and he invades Libya and he conquers Libya close to the death of Thales. So this is during Cyrus the Great. Correct. Cyrus the Great is a contemporary of Thales. Okay. And Thales is who we're starting with. So that's why we give the historical context. Helps you start making those types of connections right now. Why are we starting with is there nobody before him? No. Really? Not that we would call philosophy proper. More modern people will say, oh yes, let's talk about the philosophies of the Africans and the Indus Valleys and Far East and whatever the Native Americans were doing and blah, blah, blah. No, it's not philosophy proper. What's philosophy proper? Philosophy proper, based off of the way I gave it to you, is inductively reasoning the premises and applying logic to said premises to come to conclusions in a systematic way. So you're using logic. Thales is the first one to be systematic in his thinking. He's going to be the first one that does proof in the sense that we call proof today. Okay. What we classify as, yep, that's a proof. Thales is the first one that we know of that did that. We have, we're going to get to the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Babylons. They made a bunch of empirical mathematical discoveries. Now they, would, they did, never did anything that we would call math proper today. When, did, when, when was Thales born? Thales, I don't have an exact year for you, but we're going to be around 600 BC. 600? Mm -hmm. And mathematics was in that way before that. Highest. What do you mean mathematics? If we are talking about operating in some system of study, Right? I'm not going to call it mathematics if you're not proving something. Uh, arithmetic. When was arithmetic. Are you actually proving something or are you making empirical discoveries? Also, so what these guys did is they made empirical discoveries over and over again. Let me give you a sense of the type of thing that they made. What did the Egyptians know? The Egyptians know that if I made this triangle such that this was three cubits and this was four cubits, then, and this was five cubits, then this is pretty much a straight angle. It's exactly a straight angle. Who cares? It's good enough for our buildings. Yeah. So it's an empirical discovery. Is it actually a straight angle? They have no idea. They just, uh, so, oh, I see. So they just observed yeah. that that was the case, and they tried it a million times, and it worked every time. Exactly. Gotcha. Just empirical discoveries right. based off of what we see right in front of us. Okay. So they just, they just couldn't prove it. They didn't, they didn't prove it. They, this concept of even trying to prove something. It's such a new concept. It's crazy what these uh, Greeks decide that they're going to start doing. It's absolutely nuts. The way that knowledge is taught prior to, the whole way that you learn from textbooks, that's a whole new way of thinking. We go back before Thales, how do you learn how to do something? One of two ways. Either you're given some story where the person carries out actions and you're supposed to learn from their actions, the moral of the story. That's how you learn from like the Old Testament. Right? It's pretty much how it's supposed to be. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Some story to give you a lesson. For the Greeks, it's the Iliad and the Odyssey. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Or you go out there and someone actually shows you. This idea of, nope, I don't need to actually show you. Nope, I don't need to give you some story of the action. I can still teach you exactly what you go. Mm -hmm. And I can do it with this thing called an argument. There's no reason that you should know that based on me giving you some argument, you can come to know something that you didn't already know. You need to get it in action. And so it always thought in terms of actions. Read about people's actions and get what you're supposed to do from that. Or see their actions and get what you're supposed to do from that. This whole idea of some rigorous argument that you follow and learn from, completely new. Weird. That's what the Greeks introduced. And that's what kicks off philosophy. Philosophy proper, I mean, Paul. And that's why we say, sorry, doesn't fly. Sorry, doesn't fly. Sorry, doesn't fly. Sorry, doesn't fly. Not sure where they were at the time. Because it's not the same thing. And that's why we say Thales is the father of mathematics. He's the first one to really start doing what we call math. Yes, there were empirical discoveries. First one to start proving things, Thales. Gotcha. Yes, people were collecting facts about the universe. The first people to actually systematically start reasoning about the facts of those universe and coming to conclusions, Thales. Gotcha. Maybe it wasn't Thales, but it was definitely the Greeks. And we're going to see... For some reason, along this coast, a lot of people start thinking this way. It's going to spread in Greece and catch on in a major way. And, and you're, so you're saying that the advantage to that was that, one, uh, we were able to disprove a lot of intuitive ones. Uh, and three, we were able to make conclusions about things that aren't intuitive at all. <laughs> right, you can start with intuitive things and derive from those things things that aren't intuitive. Yes. And you never had to be shown it. And that was never in the sense that it was someone actually showed you. Yeah. Right? All learning was done through actions, either reading about actions or seeing the actions yourself and going through. Makes sense. 
This idea of learning through proof is completely novel. And so when we start talking about the Greeks' education prior to philosophy getting kicked off, we're going to talk about their physical education, and we're going to talk about their um, stories. What do they call it? I may call it their musical education, but I'm not sure that's what they call it. It will come to me in a second. Lyrical. <laughs> we'll just call it musical for the time being. So standard Greek, you had your physical education and your musical education. What was your physical education? Your physical education was what you would think of, actually working your body, exercising your body, building your body, taking care of your body, physical education. It also include things like good health, eating good food, stuff like that. Then you had your musical education, musical as in what is attributed to the muses. And so music is only part of that. Art is part of that. But your cultural education would be a better modern way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And this would be your reading of your Iliad and your Odyssey. Reading your major stories and learning the lessons you're supposed to learn from those stories. And that was pretty much your education. There isn't an education in philosophy yet. And the first institution that starts doing that in a major way is going to be Plato's Academy. Mm -hmm. We think of Plato's Academy as the first higher level institution of learning in the world. It's where the school gets its name, the academy. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Sorry. Big tangent. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Good. Uh, spring break next week. That doesn't cause conflicts for me. Doesn't cause conflicts for you. No. 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 Okay. See you guys next week. Thank you. Yep.